Section 17 of Library of the World's Best Mystery and Detective Stories, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Rashada. Library of the World's Best Mystery and Detective Stories, Volume 2, by Julianne Hawthorne. Editor. Section 17. The Dream Woman. Wilkie Collins. Hello there, hostler. Hello. My dear, why don't you look for the bell? I have looked. There is no bell. And nobody in the yard. How very extraordinary. Call again, dear. Hostler. Hello there. Hostler. My second call echoes through empty space and rouses nobody, produces, in short, no visible result. I am at the end of my resources. I don't know what to say or what to do next. Here I stand in the solitary inn-yard of a strange town with two horses to hold and a lady to take care of. By way of adding to my responsibilities, it so happens that one of the horses is dead lame, and that lady is my wife. Who am I, you will ask? There is plenty of time to answer the question. Nothing happens, and nobody appears to receive us. Let me introduce myself and my wife. I am Percy Fairbank, English gentleman, age, let us say, forty. No profession, moderate politics, middle height, fair complexion, easy character, plenty of money. My wife is a French lady. She was Mademoiselle Clotilde de Lorge when I was first presented to her at her father's house in France. I fell in love with her. I really don't know why. It might have been because I was perfectly idle and had nothing else to do at the time or it might have been because all my friends said that she was the very last woman whom I ought to think of marrying. On the surface I must own, there is nothing in common between Mrs. Fairbank and me. She is tall, she is dark, she is nervous, excitable, romantic. In all her opinions she proceeds to extremes. What could such a woman see in me? What could I see in her? I know no more than you do. In some mysterious manner we exactly suit each other. We have been man and wife for ten years, and our only regret is that we have no children. I don't know what you may think. I call that, upon the whole, a happy marriage. So much for ourselves. The next question is, what has brought us into the inn-yard, and why am I obliged to turn groom and hold the horses? We live for the most part in France, at the country house in which my wife and I first met. Occasionally, by way of variety, we pay visits to my friends in England. We are paying one of those visits now. Our host is an old college friend of mine possessed of a fine estate in Somersetshire, and we have arrived at his house, called Farley Hall, toward the close of the hunting season. On the day of which I am now writing destined to be a memorable day in our calendar, the hounds meet at Farley Hall. Mrs. Fairbank and I are mounted on two of the best horses in my friend's stables. We are quite unworthy of that distinction, for we know nothing and care nothing about hunting. On the other hand, we delight in riding, and we enjoy the breezy spring morning, and the fair and fertile English landscape surrounding us on every side. While the hunt prospers, we follow the hunt. But when a check occurs, when time passes and patience is sorely tried, when the bewildered dogs run hither and thither and strong language falls from the lips of the exasperated sportsmen, we fail to take any further interest in the proceedings. We turn our horses' heads in the direction of a grassy lane, delightfully shaded by trees. We trot merrily along the lane and find ourselves on an open common. We gallop across the common and follow the windings of a second lane. We cross a brook, we pass through a village, we emerge into pastoral solitude among the hills. The horses toss their heads and neigh to each other, and enjoy it as much as we do. The hunt is forgotten. We are as happy as a couple of children. We are actually singing a French song, when in one moment our merriment comes to an end. My wife's horse sets one of his forefeet on a loose stone and stumbles. His rider's ready hand saves him from falling. But, at the first attempt he makes to go on, the sad truth shows itself. A tendon is strained. The horse is lame. What is to be done? We are strangers in a lonely part of the country. Look where we may. We see no signs of a human habitation. There is nothing for it but to take the bridle road up the hill and try what we can discover on the other side. 
I transfer the saddles and mount my wife on my own horse. He is not used to carry a lady. He misses the familiar pressure of a man's legs on either side of him. He fidgets and starts and kicks up the dust. I follow on foot, at a respectful distance from his heels, leading the lame horse. Is there a more miserable object on the face of creation than a lame horse? I have seen lame men and lame dogs who were cheerful creatures, but I never yet saw a lame horse who didn't look heartbroken over his own misfortune. For half an hour my wife capers and curvets sideways along the bridle road. I trudge on behind her, and the heartbroken horse halts behind me. Hard by the top of the hill our melancholy procession passes a Somersetshire peasant at work in a field. I summon the man to approach us, and the man looks at me stolidly from the middle of the field without stirring a step. I ask at the top of my voice how far it is to Farley Hall. The Somersetshire peasant answers at the top of his voice, Vorteen mile! Gya drop a zider? I translate, for my wife's benefit, from the Somersetshire language into the English language. We are fourteen miles from Farley Hall, and our friend in the field desires to be rewarded for giving us that information with a drop of cider. There is a peasant painted by himself. Quite a bit of character, my dear, quite a bit of character. Mrs. Fairbank doesn't view the study of agricultural human nature with my relish. Her fidgety horse will not allow her a moment's repose. She is beginning to lose her temper. We can't go fourteen miles in this way, she says. Where is the nearest inn? Ask that brute in the field. I take a shilling from my pocket and hold it up to the sun. The shilling exercises magnetic virtues. The shilling draws the peasant slowly toward me from the middle of the field. I inform him that we want to put up the horses and to hire a carriage to take us back to Farley Hall. Where can we do that? The peasant answers with his eye on the shilling. At Underbridge, to be sure. At Underbridge, to be sure. Is it far to Underbridge? The peasant repeats, Var to Underbridge, and laughs at the question. <laughs> Underbridge is evidently close by, if we could only find it. Will you show us the way, my man? Will you jeer a drop of cider? I courteously bend my head and point to the shilling. The agricultural intelligence exerts itself. The peasant joins our melancholy procession. My wife is a fine woman, but he never once looks at my wife. And more extraordinary still, he never even looks at the horses. His eyes are with his mind, and his mind is on the shilling. We reach the top of the hill, and behold, on the other side, nestling in a valley, the shrine of our pilgrimage, the town of Underbridge. Here our guide claims his shilling and leaves us to find our inn for ourselves. I am constitutionally a polite man. I say, good morning, at parting. The guide looks at me with a shilling between his teeth to make sure that it is a good one. Morning, he says savagely, and turns his back on us, as if we had offended him. A curious product, this, of the growth of civilization. If I didn't see a church spire at Underbridge, I might suppose that we had lost ourselves on a savage island. 2. Arriving at the town, we had no difficulty in finding the inn. The town is composed of one desolate street, and midway in that street stands the inn. An ancient stone building, sadly out of repair. The painting on the sideboard is obliterated. The shutters over the long range of front windows are all closed. A cock and his hens are the only living creatures at the door. Plainly, this is one of the old inns of the stagecoach period, ruined by the railway. We pass through the open arched doorway and find no one to welcome us. We advance into the stable yard behind. I assist my wife to dismount, and there we are in the position already disclosed to the view at the opening of this narrative. No bell to ring, no human creature to answer when I call. I stand helpless, with the bridles of the horses in my hand. Mrs. Fairbank saunters gracefully down the length of the yard, and does what all women do when they find themselves in a strange place. She opens every door as she passes it and peeps in. On my side, I have just recovered my breath. I am on the point of shouting for the hostler for the third and last time, when I hear Mrs. Fairbank suddenly call to me, "'Percy, come here!' Her voice is eager and agitated. She has opened a last door at the end of the yard and has started back from some sight which has suddenly met her view. I hitch the horse's bridles on a rusty nail in the wall near me, and join my wife, 
she has turned pale and catches me nervously by the arm. Good heavens, she cries. Look at that. I look, and what do I see? I see a dingy little stable, containing two stalls. In one stall, a horse is munching his corn. In the other, a man is lying asleep on the litter. A worn, withered, woebegone man in a hostler's dress. His hollow, wrinkled cheeks, his scanty, grizzled hair, his dry, yellow skin, tell their own tale of past sorrow or suffering. There is an ominous frown on his eyebrows. There is a painful, nervous contraction on the side of his mouth. I hear him breathing convulsively when I first look in. He shudders and sighs in his sleep. It is not a pleasant sight to see, and I turn round instinctively to the bright sunlight in the yard. My wife turns me back again in the direction of the stable door. Wait, she says. Wait. He may do it again. Do what again? He was talking in his sleep, Percy, when I first looked in. He was dreaming some dreadful dream. Hush! He's beginning again. I look and listen. The man stirs on his miserable bed. The man speaks in a quick, fierce whisper through his clenched teeth. Wake up! Wake up there! Murder! There is an interval of silence. He moves one lean arm slowly until it rests over his throat. He shudders and turns on his straw. He raises his arm from his throat and feebly stretches it out. His hand clutches at the straw on the side toward which he has turned. He seems to fancy that he is grasping at the edge of something. I see his lips begin to move again. I step softly unto the stable. My wife follows me, with her hand fast clasped in mine. We both bend over him. He is talking once more in his sleep. Strange talk, mad talk this time. Light gray eyes, we hear him say, and a droop in the left eyelid, flaxen hair with a gold-yellow streak in it. All right, mother, fair white arms with a down on them, little, lady's hand with a reddish look round the fingernails, the knife, the cursed knife, first on one side, then on the other. Aha, you she-devil, where is the knife? He stops and grows restless on a sudden. We see him writhing on the straw. He throws up both his hands and gasps hysterically for breath. His eyes open suddenly. For a moment they look at nothing with a vacant glitter in them. Then they close again in deeper sleep. Is he dreaming still? Yes. But the dream seems to have taken a new course. When he speaks next, the tone is altered. The words are few, sadly and imploringly repeated over and over again. Say you love me. I am so fond of you. Say you love me. Say you love me. He sinks into deeper and deeper sleep, faintly repeating those words. They die away on his lips. He speaks no more. By this time, Mrs. Fairbank has got over her terror. She is devoured by curiosity now. The miserable creature on the straw has appealed to the imaginative side of her character. Her illimitable appetite for romance hungers and thirst for more. She shakes me impatiently by the arm. Did you hear? There is a woman at the bottom of it, Percy. There is love and murder in it, Percy. Where are the people in the inn? Go into the yard and call to them again. My wife belongs on her mother's side to the south of France. The south of France breeds fine women with hot tempers. I say no more. Married men will understand my position. Single men may need to be told that there are occasions when we must not only love and honor, we must also obey our wives. I turn to the door to obey my wife and find myself confronted by a stranger who has stolen on us unawares. The stranger is a tiny, sleepy, rosy old man with a vacant pudding face and a shining bald head. He wears drab breeches and gaiters and a respectable square-tailed ancient black coat. I feel instinctively that here is the landlord of the inn. "'Good morning, sir,' says the rosy old man. "'I'm a little hard of hearing.' Was it you that was a-calling just now in the yard? Before I can answer, my wife interposes. She insists, in a shrill voice adapted to our host's hardness of hearing, on knowing who that unfortunate person is sleeping on the straw. Where does he come from? Why does he say such dreadful things in his sleep? Is he married or single? Did he ever fall in love with a murderess? What sort of looking woman was she? Did she really stab him or not? In short, dear Mr. Landlord, tell us the whole story. Dear Mr. Landlord waits drowsily until Mrs. Fairbanks has quite done, then delivers himself on his reply as follows. His name is Francis Raven. He's an independent Methodist. He was forty-five year old last birthday, and he's my hostler. That's a story. 
My wife's hot southern temper finds its way to her foot and expresses itself by a stamp on the stable yard. The landlord turns himself sleepily round and looks at the horses. Fine pair of horses, them two in the yard. Do you want to put them in my stables? I reply in the affirmative by a nod. The landlord, bent on making himself agreeable to my wife, addresses her once more. I'm going to wake Francis Raven. He's an independent Methodist. He was forty-five year old last birthday, and he's my hostler. That's his story. Having issued this second edition of his interesting narrative, the landlord enters the stable. We follow him to see how he will wake Francis Raven and what will happen upon that. The stable broom stands in a corner. The landlord takes it, advances toward the sleeping hostler, and coolly stirs the man up with a broom as if he was a wild beast in a cage. Francis Raven starts to his feet with a cry of terror, looks at us wildly with a horrid glare of suspicion in his eyes, recovers himself the next moment, and suddenly changes into a decent, quiet, respectable serving man. I beg your pardon, ma'am. I beg your pardon, sir. The tone and manner in which he makes his apologies are both above his apparent station in life. I begin to catch the infection of Mrs. Fairbank's interest in this man. We both follow him out into the yard to see what he will do with the horses. The manner in which he lifts the injured leg of the lame horse tells me at once that he understands his business. Quickly and quietly, he leads the animal into an empty stable. Quickly and quietly, he gets a bucket of hot water and puts the lame horse's leg into it. The warm water will reduce the swelling, sir. I will bandage the leg afterwards. All that he does is done intelligently. All that he says, he says to the purpose. Nothing wild, nothing strange about him now. Is this the same man who we heard talking in his sleep? The same man who woke with that cry of terror and that horrid suspicion in his eyes? I determined to try him with one or two questions. 3. Not much to do here, I say to the hostler. Very little to do, sir, the hostler replies. Anybody staying in the house? The house is quite empty, sir. I thought you were all dead. I could make nobody hear me. The landlord is very deaf, sir, and the waiter is out on an errand. Yes, and you were fast asleep in the stable. Do you often take a nap in the daytime? The worn face of the hostler faintly flushes. His eyes look away from my eyes for the first time. Mrs. Fairbank furtively pinches my arm. Are we on the eve of a discovery at last? I repeat my question. The man has no civil alternative but to give me an answer. The answer is given in these words. I was tired out, sir. You wouldn't have found me asleep in the daytime but for that. Tired out, eh? You had been hard at work, I suppose. No, sir. What was it then? He hesitates again and answers unwillingly. I was up all night. Up all night? Anything going on in the town? Nothing going on, sir. Anybody ill? Nobody ill, sir. That reply is the last. Try as I may, I can extract nothing more from him. He turns away and busies himself in attending to the horse's leg. I leave the stable to speak to the landlord about the carriage which is to take us back to Farley Hall. Mrs. Fairbank remains with the hostler and favors me with a look at parting. The look says plainly, I mean to find out why he was up all night. Leave him to me. The ordering of the carriage is easily accomplished. The inn possesses one horse and one chaise. The landlord has a story to tell about the horse, and a story to tell about the chaise. They resemble the story of Francis Raven, with this exception, that the horse and chaise belong to no religious persuasion. The horse will be nine year old next birthday. I've had the chaise for four and twenty year. Mr. Max of Underbridge, he bred the horse, and Mr. Pooley of Yvol, he built the chaise. It's my horse and my chaise, and that's their story. Having relieved his mind of these details, the landlord proceeds to put the harness on the horse. By way of assisting him, I drag the chaise into the yard. Just as our preparations are completed, Mrs. Fairbank appears. A moment or two later, the hostler follows her out. He has bandaged the horse's leg and is now ready to drive us to Farley Hall. I observe signs of agitation in his face and manner which suggest that my wife has found her way into his confidence. I put the question to her privately in a corner of the yard. Well, have you found out why Francis Raven was up all night? Mrs. Fairbank has an eye to dramatic effect. Instead of answering plainly yes or no, she suspends the interest and excites the audience by putting a question on her side. What is the day of the month, dear? The day of the month is the first of March. The first of March, Percy, is Francis Raven's birthday. 
I try to look as if I was interested and don't succeed. Francis was born, Mrs. Fairbank proceeds gravely, at two o'clock in the morning. I begin to wonder whether my wife's intellect is going the way of the landlord's intellect. Is that all? I ask. It is not all, Mrs. Fairbank answers. Francis Raven sits up on the morning of his birthday because he is afraid of going to bed. And why is he afraid of going to bed? Because he is in peril of his life on his birthday. On his birthday, at two o'clock in the morning, as regularly as the birthday comes round. There she stops. Has she discovered no more than that? No more thus far? I begin to feel really interested by this time. I ask eagerly what it means. Mrs. Fairbank points mysteriously to the chaise, with Francis Raven, hitherto for our hostler, now our coachman, waiting for us to get in. The chaise has a seat for two in front and a seat for one behind. My wife casts a warning look at me and places herself on the seat in front. The necessary consequence of this arrangement is that Mrs. Fairbank sits by the side of the driver during a journey for two hours and more. Need I state the result? It would be an insult to your intelligence to state the result. Let me offer you my place in the chaise, and let Francis Raven tell his terrible story in his own words. End of section 17. Section 18 of Library of the World's Best Mystery and Detective Stories, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Leonard Wilson. Library of the World's Best Mystery and Detective Stories, Volume 2, Julian Hawthorne, Editor. Section 18. Part two of The Dream Woman by Wilkie Collins. The second narrative, the hustler's story, told by himself. It is now ten years ago since I got my first warning of the great trouble of my life in the vision of a dream. I shall be better able to tell you about it if you will please suppose yourselves to be drinking tea along with us in our little cottage in Cambridgeshire ten years since. The time was the close of day, and there were three of us at the table, namely my mother, myself, and my mother's sister, Mrs. Chance. These two were Scotchwomen by birth, and both were widows. There was no other resemblance between them that I can call to mind. My mother had lived all her life in England, and had no more of the Scotch brogue on her tongue than I have. My Aunt Chance had never been out of Scotland until she came to keep house with my mother after her husband's death. And when she opened her lips, you heard broad Scotch, I can tell you, if you ever heard it yet. As it fell out, there was a matter of some consequence in debate among us that evening. It was this, whether I should do well or not to take a long journey on foot the next morning. Now the next morning happened to be the day before my birthday, and the purpose of the journey was to offer myself for a situation as groom at a great house in the neighboring county to ours. The place was reported as likely to fall vacant in about three weeks' time. I was as well fitted to fill it as any other man. In the prosperous days of our family, my father had been manager of a training stable, and he had kept me employed among the horses from my boyhood upward. Please to excuse my troubling you with these small matters. They all fit into my story farther on, as you will soon find out. My poor mother was dead against my leaving home on the morrow. You can never walk all the way there and all the way back again by tomorrow night, she says. The end of it will be that you will sleep away from home on your birthday. You have never done that yet, Francis, since your father's death. I don't like your doing it now. Wait a day longer, my son, only one day. For my own part, I was weary of being idle, and I couldn't abide the notion of delay. Even one day might make all the difference. Some other man might take time by the forelock and get the place. Consider how long I've been out of work, I says and don't ask me to put off the journey. I won't fail you, mother. I'll get back by tomorrow night, if I have to pay my last sixpence for a lift in a cart. 
my mother shook her head i don't like it francis i don't like it there was no moving her from that view we argued and argued until we were both at a deadlock it ended in our agreeing to refer the difference between us to my mother's sister mrs chance while we were trying hard to convince each other my aunt chance sat as dumb as a fish stirring her tea and thinking her own thoughts when we made our appeal to her she seemed as it were to wake up ye baith refer it to me poor judgment she says in her broad scotch we both answered yes upon that my aunt chance first cleared the tea-table and then pulled out from the pocket of her gown a pack of cards uh, don't run away if you please with the notion that this was done lightly with the view to amuse my mother and me my aunt chance seriously believed that she could look into the future by telling fortunes on the cards she did nothing herself without first consulting the cards she could give no more serious proof of her interest in my welfare than the proof which she was offering now i don't say it profanely i only mention the fact the cards had in some incomprehensible way got themselves jumbled up together with her religious convictions you meet with people nowadays who believe in spirits working by way of tables and chairs on the same principle if there is any principle in it my aunt chance believed in providence working by way of the cards whether you are right francie or your mither whether you will do weel or ill the morrow or go or stay the cards will tell it we are all in the hands of providence the cards will tell it hearing this my mother turned her head aside with something of a sour look in her face her sister's notions about the cards were little better than flat blasphemy to her mind but she kept her opinion to herself my aunt chance to own the truth had inherited through her late husband a pension of thirty pounds a year this was an important contribution to our housekeeping and we poor relations were bound to treat her with a certain respect as for myself if my poor father never did anything else for me before he fell into difficulties he gave me a good education and raised me thank god above superstitions of all kinds however a very little amused me in those days and i waited to have my fortune told as patiently as if i believed in it too my aunt began her hocus-pocus by throwing out all the cards in the pack under seven she shuffled the rest with her left hand for luck and then she gave them to me to cut we your left hand francie mind that put your pr trust in providence but do not forget that your luck's in your left hand a long and roundabout shifting of the cards followed reducing them in number until there were just fifteen of them left laid out neatly before my aunt in a half circle the card which happened to lie outermost at the right-hand end of the circle was according to rule in such cases the card chosen to represent me by way of being appropriate to my situation as a poor groom out of employment the card was <laughs> the king of diamonds i take up the king of diamonds says my aunt i count seven cards for a right to left and i humbly ask a blessed on what follows my aunt shut her eyes as if she was saying grace before meat and held up to me the seventh card i called the seventh card the queen of spades my aunt opened her eyes again in a hurry and cast a sly look my way the queen of spades means a dark woman you'd be thinking in secret francie of a dark woman when a man has been out of work for more than three months his mind isn't troubled much with thinking of women light or dark i was thinking of the groom's place at the great house and i tried to say so my aunt chance wouldn't listen she treated my interpretation with contempt hoot toot there's the card in your hand if you're not thinking of her the day he'll be thinking of her the morrow where's the harm of thinking of a dark woman i was answered dark woman myself before my hair was gray hold your peace francie and watch the cards 
I watched the cards as I was told. There were seven left on the table. My aunt removed two from one end of the row, and two from the other, and desired me to call the two outermost of the three cards now left on the table. I called the ace of clubs and the ten of diamonds. My aunt Chance lifted her eyes to the ceiling with a look of devout gratitude which sorely tried my mother's patience. The ace of clubs and the ten of diamonds, taken together, signified, first, good news, evidently the news of the groom's place, secondly, a journey that lay before me, pointing plainly to my journey to-morrow, thirdly, and lastly, a sum of money, probably the groom's wages, waiting to find its way into my pockets. Having told my fortune in these encouraging terms, my aunt declined to carry the experiment any further. Eh, lad, it's a clean tempting o' providence to ask mair o' the cards than the cards have told us new. Ga ye ways to-morrow to the great house. A dark lady will meet ye at the gate, and she'll have a hand in getting ye the groom's place wi' all the gratifications and perquisites appertaining to the same. And maybe, when your pocket's full of money, you'll no be forgetting your aunt chance, maintaining her ain unblemished widowhood, with providence assisting, on thirty pounds a year. I promised to remember my aunt chance, who had the defect, by the way, of being a terribly greedy person after money, on the next happy occasion when my poor empty pockets were to be filled at last. This done, I looked at my mother. She had agreed to take her sister for umpire between us, and her sister had given it in my favor. She raised no more objections. Silently she got on her feet and kissed me, and sighed bitterly, and so left the room. My aunt Chance shook her head. I doubt, Francie, your poor mother has but a heathen notion of the virtue of the cards. By daylight the next morning I set forth on my journey. I looked back at the cottage as I opened the garden gate. At one window was my mother, with her handkerchief to her eyes. At the other stood my aunt Chance, holding up the Queen of Spades, by way of encouraging me at starting. I waved my hands to both of them in token of farewell, and stepped out briskly into the road. It was then the last day of February. Be pleased to remember, in connection with this, that the first of March was the day, and two o'clock in the morning the hour of my birth. Now you know how I came to leave home. The next thing is to tell what happened on the journey. I reached the great house in reasonably good time, considering the distance. At the very first trial of it, the prophecy of the cards turned out to be wrong. The person who met me at the lodge gate was not a dark woman, in fact, not a woman at all, but a boy. He directed me on the way to the servants' offices, and there again the cards were all wrong. I encountered not one woman, but three, and not one of the three was dark. I have stated that I am not superstitious, and I have told the truth, but I must own that I did feel a certain fluttering at the heart when I made my bow to the steward, and told him what business had brought me to the house. His answer completed the discomfiture of Aunt Chance's fortune-telling. The ill luck still pursued me. That very morning another man had applied for the groom's place, and had got it. I swallowed my disappointment as well as I could, and thanked the steward, and went to the inn in the village to get the rest and food which I sorely needed by this time. Before starting on my homeward walk, I made some inquiries at the inn, and ascertained that I might save a few miles on my return by following a new road. Furnished with full instructions, seven, several times repeated, as to the various turnings I was to take, I set forth and walked on till the evening with only one stoppage for bread and cheese. Just as it was getting toward dark, the rain came on, and the wind began to rise, and I found myself, to make matters worse, 
and of the part of the country with which I was entirely unacquainted, though I guessed myself to be some fifteen miles from home. The first house I found to inquire at was a lonely roadside inn, standing on the outskirts of a thick wood. Solitary as the place looked, it was welcome to a lost man who was also hungry, thirsty, footsore, and wet. The landlord was civil and respectable-looking, and the price he asked for a bed was reasonable enough. I was grieved to disappoint my mother, but there was no conveyance to be had, and I could go no farther afoot that night. My weariness fairly forced me to stop at the inn. I may say for myself that I am a temperate man. My supper simply consisted of some rashers of bacon, a slice of home-made bread, and a pint of ale. I did not go to bed immediately after this moderate meal, but sat up with the landlord, talking about my bad prospects and my long run of ill luck, and diverging from these topics to the subjects of horse-flesh and racing. Nothing was said either by myself, my host, or the few laborers who strayed into the tap-room, which could in the slightest degree excite my mind or set my fancy, which is only a small fancy at the best of times, playing tricks with my common sense. At a little after eleven the house was closed. I went round with the landlord and held the candle while the doors and lower windows were being secured. I noticed with surprise the strength of the bolts, bars, and iron-sheathed shutters. "'You see, we are rather lonely here,' said the landlord. "'We never have had any attempts to break in yet, but it's always as well to be on the safe side. When nobody is sleeping here, I am the only man in the house. My wife and daughter are timid, and the servant girl takes after her missuses. "'Another glass of ale before we turn in?' "'No.' Well, how such a sober man as you comes to be out of a place is more than I can understand, for one. Here's where you're to sleep. You're the only lodger tonight, and I think you'll say my missus has done her best to make you comfortable. You're quite sure you won't have another glass of ale? Very well. Good night. It was half-past eleven by the clock in the passage as we went upstairs to the bedroom. The window looked out on the wood at the back of the house. I locked my door, set my candle on the chest of drawers, and wearily got me ready for bed. The bleak wind was still blowing, and the solemn surging moan of it in the wood was very dreary to hear through the night silence. Feeling strangely wakeful, I resolved to keep the candle alight until I began to grow sleepy. The truth is, I was not quite myself. I was depressed in mind by my disappointment of the morning, and I was worn out in body by my long walk. Between the two, I own I couldn't face the prospect of lying awake in the darkness, listening to the dismal moan of the wind in the wood. Sleep stole on me before I was aware of it. My eyes closed, and I fell off to rest, without having so much as thought of extinguishing the candle. The next thing that I remember was a faint shivering that ran through me from head to foot, and a dreadful sinking pain at my heart such I had never felt before. The shivering only disturbed my slumbers. The pain woke me instantly. In one moment I passed from a state of sleep to a state of wakefulness, my eyes wide open, my mind clear on a sudden, as if by a miracle candle had burned down nearly to the last morsel of tallow, but the unsnuffed wick had just fallen off, and the light was, for the moment, fair and full. Between the foot of the bed and the closet door, I saw a person in my room. The person was a woman, standing, looking at me, with a knife in her hand. It does no credit to my courage to confess it, but the truth is the truth. I was struck speechless with terror. There I lay with my eyes on the woman. There the woman stood, with the knife in her hand, with her eyes on me. She said not a word as we stared at each other in the face, but she moved after a little, moved slowly toward the left-hand side of the bed. The light fell full on her face, a fair, fine woman with yellowish flaxen hair and light gray eyes, 
with a droop in the left eyelid. I noticed these things and fixed them in my mind before she was quite round at the side of the bed. Without saying a word, without any change in the stony stillness of her face, without any noise following her footfall, she came closer and closer, stopped at the bed head, and lifted the knife to stab me. I laid my arm over my throat to save it, but as I saw the blow coming, I threw my hand across the bed to the right side and jerked my body over that way, just as the knife came down like lightning within a hair's breadth of my shoulder. My eyes fixed on her arm and her hand. She gave me time to look at them as she slowly drew the knife out of the bed. A white, well-shaped arm, with a pretty down lying lightly over the fair skin. A delicate lady's hand, with a pink flush round the fingernails. She drew the knife out, and passed back again slowly to the foot of the bed. She stopped there for a moment, looking at me. Then she came on without saying a word, without any change in the stony stillness of her face, without any noise following her footfall, came on to the side of the bed where I now lay. Getting near me, she lifted the knife again, and I drew myself away to the left side. She struck as before right into the mattress with a swift downward action of her arm, and she missed me as before by a hair's breadth. This time my eyes wandered from her to the knife. It was like the large clasp-knives which laboring men used to cut their bread and bacon with. Her delicate little fingers did not hide more than two-thirds of the handle. I noticed that it was made of buckhorn, clean and shining as the blade was, and looking like new. For the second time she drew the knife out of the bed, and suddenly hid it away in the wide sleeve of her gown. That done, she stopped by the bedside, watching me. For an instant I saw her standing in that position. Then the wick of the spent candle fell over into the socket, the flame dwindled to a little blue point, and the room grew dark. A moment or less, if possible, passed so, and then the wick flared up smokily for the last time. My eyes were still looking for her over the right-hand side of the bed when the last flash of light came. Look as I might, I could see nothing. The woman with the knife was gone. I began to get back to myself again. I could feel my heart beating. I could hear the woeful moaning of the wind in the wood. I could leap up in bed and gave the alarm before she escaped from the house. Murder! Wake up there! Murder! Nobody answered to the alarm. I rose and groped my way through the darkness to the door of the room. By the way she must have got in. By that way she must have gone out. The door of the room was fast locked exactly as I had left it on going to bed. I looked at the window, fast locked too. Hearing a voice outside, I opened the door. There was the landlord coming toward me along the passage, with his burning candle in one hand and his gun in the other. What is it? he says, looking at me in no very friendly way. I could only answer in a whisper. A woman with a knife in her hand, in my room, a fair yellow-haired woman, she jabbed at me with a knife twice over. He lifted his candle and looked at me steadily from head to foot. She seems to have missed you twice over. I dodged the knife as it came down. It struck the bed each time. Go in and see. The landlord took his candle into the bedroom immediately. In less than a minute he came out again into the passage in a violent passion. The devil fly away with you and your woman with a knife. There isn't a mark in the bedclothes anywhere. What do you mean by coming into a man's plights and frightening his family out of their wits by a dream? A dream? The woman who had tried to stab me, not a living human being like myself? I began to shake and shiver. The horrors got hold of me at the bare thought of it. I leave the house, I said. Better be out on the road in the rain and dark than back in that room after what I've seen in it. Lend me the light to get my clothes by, and tell me what I'm to pay. The landlord led the way back with his light into the bedroom. Pie, says he, you'll find your score on the slate when you go downstairs. I wouldn't have taken you in for all the money you've got about you if I had known your dreaming, screeching ways beforehand. Look at the bed. Where's the cut of a knife in it? Look at the window. Is the lock bursted? Look at the door, which I heard you fasten yourself. 
Is it broke in? A murdering woman with a knife in my house. You ought to be ashamed of yourself. My eyes followed his hand as it pointed first to the bed, then to the window, then to the door. There was no gainsaying it. The bedsheet was as sound as on the day it was made. The window was fast. The door hung on its hinges as steady as ever. I huddled my clothes on without speaking. We went downstairs together. I looked at the clock in the bar-room. The time was twenty minutes past two in the morning. I paid my bill, and the landlord let me out. The rain had ceased, but the night was dark, and the wind was bleaker than ever. Little did the darkness, or the cold, or the doubt about the way home matter to me. My mind was away from all these things. My mind was fixed on the vision in the bedroom. What had I seen trying to murder me? The creature of a dream? Or that other creature from the world beyond the grave, whom men call ghost? I could make nothing of it as I walked along in the night. I had made nothing of it by midday, when I stood at last, after many times missing my road, on the doorstep of home. My mother came out alone to welcome me back. There were no secrets between us, too. I told her all that had happened, just as I have told it to you. She kept silence till I had done. And then she put a question to me. What time was it, Francis, when you saw the woman in your dream? I had looked at the clock when I left the inn, and I had noticed that the hands pointed to twenty minutes past two. Allowing for the time consumed in speaking to the landlord, and in getting on my clothes, I answered that I must have first seen the woman at two o'clock in the morning. In other words, I had not only seen her on my birthday, but at the hour of my birth. My mother still kept silence. Lost in her own thoughts, she took me by the hand and led me into the parlour. Her writing-desk was on the table by the fireplace. She opened it and signed to me to take a chair by her side. My son, your memory is a bad one, and mine is fast failing me. Tell me again what the woman looked like. I want her to be as well known to both of us years hence as she is now. I obeyed, wondering what strange fancy might be working in her mind. I spoke, and she wrote the words as they fell from my lips. A light grey eyes with a droop in the left eyelid, flaxen hair with a golden yellow streak in it, white arms with a down upon them, little lady's hands with a rosy red look about the fingernails. Did you notice how she was dressed, Francis? No, mother. Did you notice the knife? Yes, a large clasp knife with a buckhorn handle as good as new. My mother added the description of the knife, also the year, month, day of the week, and hour of the day when the dream woman appeared to me at the inn. That done, she locked up the paper in her desk. Not a word, Francis, to your aunt. Not a word to any living soul. Keep your dream a secret between you and me. The weeks passed and the months passed. My mother never returned to the subject again. As for me, time which wears out all things wore out my remembrance of the dream. Little by little, the image of the woman grew dimmer and dimmer. Little by little, she faded out of my mind. The story of the warning is now told. Judge for yourself if it was a true warning or a false when you hear what happened to me on my next birthday. In the summer time of the year, the wheel of fortune turned the right way for me at last. I was smoking my pipe one day near an old stone quarry at the entrance to our village when a carriage accident happened which gave a new turn, as it were, to my lot in life. It was an accident of the commonest kind, not worth mentioning it any length. A lady driving herself, a runaway horse, a cowardly manservant in attendance, frightened out of his wits, and the stone quarry too near to be agreeable. That is what I saw all in a few moments between two whiffs of my pipe. I stopped the horse at the edge of the quarry and got myself a little hurt by the shaft of the chaise. But that didn't matter. 
the lady declared i had saved her life and her husband coming with her to our cottage the next day took me into his service then and there the lady happened to be of a dark complexion and it may amuse you to hear that my aunt's chance instantly pitched on that circumstance as a means of saving the credit of the cards here was the promise of the queen of spades performed to the very letter by means of a dark woman just as my aunt had told me in the time to come francis beware of putting your ain blinded interpretation on the cards you're already i trow to murmur under a dispensation of providence that ye cannot fathom like the israelites of old i'll say de mare to ye maybe when the money's pourin into your pockets you'll no forget your aunt chance left like a sparrow on the housetop wi a small annuity of thirty pounds a year i remained in my situation at the west end of london until the spring of the new year about that time my master's health failed the doctors ordered him away to foreign parts and the establishment was broken up but the turn in my luck still held good when i left my place i left it thanks to the generosity of my kind master with a yearly allowance granted to me in remembrance of the day when i had saved my mistress's life for the future i could go back to service or not as i pleased my little income was enough to support my mother and myself my master and mistress left england toward the end of february certain matters of business to do for them detained me in london until the last day of the month i was only able to leave for our village by the evening train to keep my birthday with my mother as usual it was bedtime when i got to the cottage and i was sorry to find that she was far from well to make matters worse she had finished her bottle of medicine on the previous day and had omitted to get it replenished as the doctor had strictly directed he dispensed his own medicines and i offered to go and knock him up she refused to let me do this and after giving me my supper sent me away to my bed i fell asleep for a little and woke again my mother's bedchamber was next to mine i heard my aunt chance's heavy footsteps going to and fro in the room and suspecting something wrong knocked at the door my mother's pains had returned upon her there was a serious necessity for relieving her sufferings as speedily as possible i put on my clothes and ran off with the medicine bottle in my hand to the other end of the village where the doctor lived the church clock chimed the quarter to two on my birthday just as i reached his house one ring of the night bell brought him to his bedroom window to speak to me he told me to wait and he would let me in at the surgery door i noticed while i was waiting that the night was wonderfully fair and warm for the time of year the old stone quarry where the carriage accident had happened was within view the moon in the clear heavens slid it up almost as bright as day in a minute or two the doctor left me into the surgery i closed the door noticing that he had left his room very lightly clad he kindly pardoned my mother's neglect of his directions and set to work at once at compounding the medicine we were both intent on the bottle he filling it and i holding the light when we heard the surgery door suddenly opened from the street who could possibly be up and about in our quiet village at the second hour of the morning the person who opened the door appeared within range of the light of the candle to complete our amazement the person proved to be a woman she walked up to the counter and standing side by side with me lifted her veil at the moment when she showed her face i heard the church clock strike two she was a stranger to me and a stranger to the doctor she was also beyond all comparison the most beautiful woman i have ever seen in my life i saw the light under the door she said i want some medicine she spoke quite composedly as if there was nothing at all extraordinary in her being out in the village at two in the morning and following me into the surgery to ask for medicine the doctor stared at her as if he suspected his own eyes of deceiving him 
who are you he asked how do you come to be wandering about at this time in the morning she paid no heed to his questions she only told him coolly what she wanted i have got a bad toothache i want a bottle of laudanum the doctor recovered himself when she asked for the laudanum he was on his own ground you know when it came to a matter of laudanum and he spoke to her smartly enough this time oh you have got the toothache have you let me look at the tooth she shook her head and laid the two shilling piece on the counter i won't trouble you to look at the tooth she said there is the money let me have the laudanum if you please the doctor put the two shilling piece back again in her hand i don't sell laudanum to strangers he answered if you are in any distress of body or mind that is another matter i shall be glad to help you she put the money back in her pocket you can't help me she said as quietly as ever good morning with that she opened the surgery door to go out again into the street so far i had not spoken a word on my side i had stood with the candle in my hand not knowing i was holding it with my eyes fixed on her with my mind fixed on her like a man bewitched her looks betrayed even more plainly than her words her resolution in one way or another to destroy herself when she opened the door in my alarm at what might happen i found the use of my tongue stop i cried out wait for me i want to speak to you before you go away she lifted her eyes with a look of careless surprise and a mocking smile on her lips what can you have to say to me she stopped and laughed to herself oh why not she said i have got nothing to do and nowhere to go she turned back a step and nodded to me you're a strange man i think i'll humor you i'll wait outside the door of the surgery closed on her she was gone i am ashamed to own what happened next the only excuse for me is that i was really and truly a man bewitched i turned me round to follow her out without once thinking of my mother the doctor stopped me don't forget the medicine he said and if you will take my advice don't trouble yourself about that woman rouse up the constable it's his business to look after her not yours i held out my hand for the medicine in silence i was afraid i should fail in respect if i trusted myself to answer him he must have seen as i saw that she wanted the laudanum to poison herself he had to my mind taken a very heartless view of the matter i just thanked him when he gave me the medicine and went out she was waiting for me as she had promised walking slowly to and fro a tall graceful solitary figure in the bright moonbeams they shed over her fair complexion her bright golden hair her large gray eyes just the light that suited them best she looked hardly mortal when she first turned to speak to me well she said and what do you want in spite of my pride or my shyness or my better sense whichever it might be all my heart went out to her in a moment i caught hold of her by the hands and owned what was in my thoughts as freely as if i had known her for a half a lifetime you mean to destroy yourself i said and i mean to prevent you from doing it if i follow you about all night i'll prevent you from doing it she laughed you saw yourself that he wouldn't sell me the laudanum do you really care whether i live or die she squeezed my hands gently as she put the question her eyes searched mine with a languid lingering look in them that ran through me like fire my voice died away on my lips i couldn't answer her she understood without my answering you have given me a fancy for living by speaking kindly to me she said kindness has a wonderful effect on women and dogs and other domestic animals it is only men who are superior to kindness make your mind easy i promise to take as much care of myself as if i was the happiest woman living don't let me keep you here out of your bed but which way are you going miserable wretch that i was i had forgotten my mother with the medicine in my hand i am going home i said 
well, where are you staying at the inn she laughed her bitter laugh and pointed to the stone quarry there is my inn for to-night she said when i got tired of walking about i rested there we walked on together on my way home i took the liberty of asking her if she had any friends i thought i had one friend left she said or you would never have met me in this place it turns out i was wrong my friend's door was closed in my face some hours since my friend's servants threatened me with the police i had nowhere else to go after trying my luck in your neighborhood and nothing left but my two shilling piece and these rags on my back what respectable innkeeper would take me into his house i walked about wondering how i could find my way out of the world without disfiguring myself and without suffering much pain you have no river in these parts i didn't see any way out of the world till i heard you ringing at the doctor's house i got a glimpse at the bottles in the surgery when he let you in and i thought of the laudanum directly what were you doing there who is the medicine for your wife oh, i am not married she laughed again not married if i was a little better dressed there might be a chance for me where do you live here we had arrived by this time at my mother's door she held out her hand to say good-bye houseless and homeless as she was she never asked me to give her a shelter for the night it was my proposal that she should rest under my roof unknown to my mother and my aunt our kitchen was built out of the back of the cottage she might remain there unseen and unheard until the household was astir in the morning i led her into the kitchen and set a chair for her by the dying embers of the fire i dare say i was to blame shamefully to blame if you like i only wonder what you would have done in my place on your word of honor as a man would you have let that beautiful creature wander back to the shelter of the stone quarry like a stray dog god help the woman who is foolish enough to trust and love you if you would have done that i left her by the fire and went to my mother's room end of section eighteen part two of the dream woman reading by leonard wilson of springfield ohio Section 19 of Library of the World's Best Mystery and Detective Stories, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Leonard Wilson. Library of the World's Best Mystery and Detective Stories, Volume 2. Julian Hawthorne, Editor. Section 19, Part 3 of The Dream Woman by Wilkie Collins, a continuation of the second narrative, The Hustler's Story, told by himself. If you have ever felt the heartache, you will know what I suffered in secret when my mother took my hand and said, I am sorry, Francis, that your night's rest has been disturbed through me. I gave her the medicine and I waited by her till the pains abated. My aunt Chance went back to her bed, and my mother and I were left alone. I noticed that her writing desk, moved from its customary place, was in the bed by her side. She saw me looking at it. This is your birthday, Francis, she said. Have you anything to tell me? I had so completely forgotten my dream that I had no notion of what was passing in her mind when she said those words. For a moment there was a guilty fear in me that she suspected something. I turned away my face and said, No, mother, I have nothing to tell. She signed to me to stoop down over the pillow and kiss her. God bless you, my love, she said, and many happy returns of the day. She patted my hand and closed her weary eyes and little by little fell off peaceably into sleep. I stole downstairs again. 
I think the good influence of my mother must have followed me down. At any rate, this is true. I stopped with my hand on the closed kitchen door and said to myself, Suppose I leave the house and leave the village without seeing her or speaking to her more. Should I really have fled from temptation in this way if I had been left to myself to decide? Who can tell? As things were, I was not left to decide. While my doubt was in my mind, she heard me and opened the kitchen door. My eyes and her eyes met. That ended it. We were together, unsuspected and undisturbed, for the next two hours. Time enough for her to reveal the secret of her wasted life. Time enough for her to take possession of me as her own, to do with me as she liked. It is needless to dwell here on the misfortunes which had brought her low. They are misfortunes too common to interest anybody. Her name was Alicia Warlock. She had been born and bred a lady. She had lost her station, her character, and her friends. Virtue shuddered at the sight of her, and vice had got her for the rest of her days. Shocking and common, as I told you. It made no difference to me. I have said it already. I say it again. I was a man bewitched. Is there anything so very wonderful in that? Just remember who I was. Among the honest women in my own station in life, where could I have found the like of her? Could they walk as she walked, and look as she looked? When they gave me a kiss, did their lips linger over it as hers did? Had they her skin, her laugh, her foot, her hand, her touch? She never had a speck of dirt on her. I tell you, her flesh was a perfume. When she embraced me, her arms folded round me like the wings of angels, and her smile covered me softly with its light like the sun in heaven. I leave you to laugh at me or to cry over me, just as your temper may incline. I am not trying to excuse myself. I am trying to explain. You are gentlefolks. What dazzled and maddened me is everyday experience to you. Fallen or not, angel or devil, it came to this. She was a lady, and I was a groom. Before the house was astir, I got her away, by the workman's train, to a large manufacturing town in our parts. Here, with my savings and money to help her, she could get her outfit of decent clothes and her lodging among strangers who asked no questions so long as they were paid. Here, now on one pretense, and now on another, I could visit her, and we could both plan together what our future lives were to be. I need not tell you that I stood pledged to make her my wife. A man in my station always marries a woman of her sort. Do you wonder if I was happy at this time? I should have been perfectly happy, but for one little drawback. It was this. I was never quite at my ease in the presence of my promised wife. I don't mean that I was shy with her, or suspicious of her, or ashamed of her. The uneasiness I am speaking of was caused by a faint doubt in my mind whether I had not seen her somewhere before the morning when we met at the doctor's house. Over and over again I found myself wondering whether her face did not remind me of some other face. What other, I never could tell. This strange feeling, this one question that could never be answered, vexed me to a degree that you would hardly credit. It came between us at the strangest times, oftenest, however, at night, when the candles were lit. You have known what it is to try and remember a forgotten name, and to fail, such as you may, to find it in your mind. That was my case. I failed to find my lost face, just as you failed to find your lost name. In three weeks we had talked matters over, and had arranged how I was to make a clean breast of it at home. 
by Alicia's advice, I was to describe her as having been one of my fellow servants during the time I was employed under my kind master and mistress in London. There was no fear now of my mother taking any harm from the shock of a great surprise. Her health had improved during the three weeks interval. On the first evening, when she was able to take her old place at tea-time, I summoned my courage and told her I was going to be married. The poor soul flung her arms around my neck and burst out crying for joy. Oh, Francis, she says, I am so glad you will have somebody to comfort you and care for you when I am gone. As for my Aunt Chance, you can anticipate what she did without being told. Ah, me, if there had been really any prophetic virtue in the cards, what a terrible warning they might have given us that night. It was arranged that I was to bring my promised wife to dinner at the cottage on the next day. I own I was proud of Alicia when I led her into our little parlour at the appointed time. She had never, to my mind, looked so beautiful as she looked that day. I never noticed any other woman's dress. I noticed hers as carefully as if I had been a woman myself. She wore a black silk gown with plain collar and cuffs, and a modest lavender-colored bonnet with one white rose in it placed at the side. My mother, dressed in her Sunday best, rose up all in a flutter to welcome her daughter-in-law that was to be. She walked forward a few steps, half smiling, half in tears. She looked Alicia full in the face, and suddenly stood still. Her cheeks turned white in an instant. Her eyes stared in horror. Her hands dropped helplessly at her sides. She staggered back and fell into the arms of my aunt, standing behind her. It was no swoon. She kept her senses. Her eyes turned slowly from Alicia to me. Francis, she said, does that woman's face remind you of nothing? Before I could answer, she pointed to a writing desk on the table at the fireside. Bring it, she cried, bring it. At the same moment, I felt Alicia's hand on my shoulder and saw Alicia's face red with anger and no wonder. What does this mean, she asked. Does your mother want to insult me? I said a few words to quiet her. What they were, I don't remember. I was so confused and astonished at the time. Before I had done, I heard my mother behind me. My aunt had fetched her desk. She had opened it. She had taken a paper from it. Step by step, helping herself along by the wall, she came nearer and nearer with the paper in her hand. She looked at the paper. She looked in Alicia's face. She lifted the long, loose sleeve of her gown and examined her hand and arm. I saw fear suddenly take the place of anger in Alicia's eyes. She shook herself free of my mother's grasp. Bad, she said to herself, and Francis never told me. With those words, she ran out of the room. I was hastening out after her when my mother signed to me to stop. She read the words written on the paper. While they fell slowly, one by one, from her lips, she pointed toward the open door. Light gray eyes with a droop in the left eyelid, flaxen hair with a gold-yellow streak in it, white arms with a down upon them, little lady's hand with a rosy red look about the fingernails. The dream woman, Francis, the dream woman! Something darkened the parlor window as those words were spoken. I looked sidelong at the shadow. Alicia Warlock had come back. She was peering in at us over the low window blind. There was the fatal face which had first looked at me in the bedroom of the lonely inn. There, resting on the window blind, was the lovely little hand which had held the murderous knife. I had seen her before we met in the village. The dream woman. The dream woman. I expect nobody to approve of what I have next to tell of myself. In three weeks from the day when my mother had identified her with the woman of the dream, I took Alicia Warlock to church and made her my wife. I was a man bewitched again and again, I say it, I was a man bewitched. During the interval before my marriage, our little household at the cottage was broken up. 
My mother and my aunt quarrelled. My mother, believing in the dream, entreated me to break off my engagement. My aunt, believing in the cards, urged me to marry. This difference of opinion produced a dispute between them, in the course of which my aunt Chance, quite unconscious of having any superstitious feelings of her own, actually set out the cards which prophesied happiness to me in my married life, and asked my mother how anybody but a blinded heathen could be fool enough after seeing these cards to believe in a dream. This was naturally too much for my mother's patience. Hard words followed on either side. Mrs. Chance returned in a dudgeon to her friends in Scotland. She left me a written statement of my future prospects, as revealed by the cards, and with it an address at which a post-office order would reach her. The day was not that far off, she remarked, when Francie might remember what he owed to his aunt Chance, maintaining her ain unblemished widowhood on thirty pounds a year. Having refused to give her sanction to my marriage, my mother also refused to be present at the wedding, or to visit Alicia afterwards. There was no anger at the bottom of this conduct on her part. Believing as she did in this dream, she was simply in mortal fear of my wife. I understood this, and I made allowances for her. Not a cross word passed between us. My one happy remembrance now, though I did disobey her in the matter of my marriage, is this. I loved and respected my good mother to the last. As for my wife, she expressed no regret at the estrangement between her mother-in-law and herself. By common consent, we never spoke on that subject. We settled in the manufacturing town which I have already mentioned, and we kept a lodging house. My kind master, at my request, granted me a lump sum in place of my annuity. This put us into a good house, decently furnished. For a while, things went well enough. I may describe myself at this time of my life as a happy man. My misfortunes began with the return of the complaint with which my mother had already suffered. The doctor confessed, when I asked him the question, that there was danger to be dreaded this time. Naturally, after hearing this, I was a good deal away at the cottage. Naturally, also, I left the business of looking after the house, in my absence, to my wife. Little by little I found her beginning to alter toward me. While my back was turned, she formed acquaintances with people of the doubtful and dissipated sort. One day I observed something in her manner which forced the suspicion on me that she had been drinking. Before the week was out, my suspicion was a certainty. From keeping company with drunkards, she had grown to be a drunkard herself. I did all a man could do to reclaim her. Quite useless. She had never really returned the love I felt for her. I had no influence. I could do nothing. My mother, hearing of this last worst trouble, resolved to try what her influence could do. Ill as she was, I found her one day dressed to go out. I am not long for this world, Francis, she said. I shall not feel easy on my deathbed, unless I have done my best to the last to make you happy. I mean to put my own fears and my own feelings out of the question, and go with you to your wife, and try what I can to reclaim her. Take me home with you, Francis. Let me do all I can to help my son before it is too late. How could I disobey her? We took the railway to the town. It was only half an hour's ride. By one o'clock in the afternoon we reached my house. It was our dinner hour, and Alicia was in the kitchen. I was able to take my mother quietly into the parlour, and then to prepare my wife for the visit. She had drunk but little at that early hour, and luckily the devil in her was tamed for the time. She followed me into the parlour, and the meeting passed off better than I had ventured to forecast, with this one drawback, that my mother, though she tried hard to control herself, shrank from looking my wife in the face when she spoke to her. It was a relief to me when Alicia began to prepare the table for dinner. She laid the cloth, 
brought in the bread tray and cut some slices for us from the loaf then she returned to the kitchen at that moment while i was still anxiously watching my mother i was startled by seeing the same ghastly change pass over her face which had altered it in the morning when alicia and she first met before i could say a word she started up with a look of horror take me back home home again francis come with me and never go back more i was afraid to ask for an explanation i could only sign her to be silent and helped her quickly to the door as we passed the bread tray on the table she stopped and pointed to it did you see what your wife cut the bread with she asked no mother i was not noticing what was it look i did look a new clasp knife with a buckhorn handle lay with the loaf in the bread tray i stretched out my hand to possess myself of it at the same moment there was a noise in the kitchen and my mother caught me by the arm the knife of the dream francis i'm faint with fear take me away before she comes back i couldn't speak to comfort or even to answer her superior as i was to superstition the discovery of the knife staggered me in silence i helped my mother out of the house and took her home i held out my hand to say good-bye she tried to stop me don't go back francis don't go back i must get the knife mother i must go back by the next train i held to that resolution by the next train i went back my wife had of course discovered our secret departure from the house she had been drinking she was in a fury of passion the dinner in the kitchen was flung under the grate the cloth was off the parlor table where was the knife i was foolish enough to ask for it she refused to give it to me in the course of the dispute between us which followed i discovered that there was a horrible story attached to the knife it had been used in a murder years since and had been so skillfully hidden that the authorities had been unable to produce it at the trial by help of some of her disreputable friends my wife had been able to purchase this relic of a bygone crime her perverted nature set some horrid unacknowledged value on the knife seeing there was no hope of getting it by fair means i determined to search for it later in the day in secret the search was unsuccessful night came on and i left the house to walk about the streets you will understand what a broken man i was by this time when i tell you i was afraid to sleep in the same room with her three weeks passed still she refused to give up the knife and still that fear of sleeping in the same room with her possessed me i walked about at night or dozed in the parlor or sat watching by my mother's bedside before the end of the first week in the new month the worst misfortune of all befell me my mother died it wanted then but a short time to my birthday she had longed to live till that day i was present at her death her last words in this world were addressed to me don't go back my son don't go back i was obliged to go back if it was only to watch my wife in the last days of my mother's illness she had spitefully added a sting to my grief by declaring she would assert her right to attend the funeral in spite of all that i could do or say she held to her word on the day appointed for the burial she forced herself inflamed and shameless with drink into my presence and swore she would walk in the funeral procession to my mother's grave this last insult after all i had gone through already was more than i could endure it maddened me try to make allowances for a man beside himself i struck her the instant the blow was dealt i repented it she crouched down silent in a corner of the room and eyed me steadily it was a look that cooled my hot blood in an instant there was no time now to think of making atonement i could only risk the worst and make sure of her till the funeral was over i locked her into her bedroom when i came back after laying my mother in the grave 
I found her sitting by the bedside, very much altered in look and bearing, with a bundle on her lap. She faced me quietly. She spoke with a curious stillness in her voice, strangely and unnaturally composed in look and manner. No man has ever struck me yet, she said. My husband shall have no second opportunity. Set the door open and let me go. She passed me and left the room. I saw her walk away up the street. Was she gone for good? All that night I watched and waited. No footstep came near the house. The next night, overcome with fatigue, I lay down on the bed in my clothes, with the door locked, the key on the table, and the candle burning. My slumber was not disturbed. The third night, the fourth, the fifth, the sixth passed, and nothing happened. I lay down on the seventh night, still suspicious of something happening, still in my clothes, still with the door locked, the key on the table, and the candle burning. My rest was disturbed. I awoke twice without any sensation of uneasiness. The third time, that horrid shivering of the night at the lonely inn, that awful sinking pain at the heart, came back again and roused me in an instant. My eyes turned to the left-hand side of the bed. And there stood, looking at me, the dream woman again? No, my wife, the living woman with the face of the dream and the attitude of the dream, the fair arm up, the knife clasped in the delicate white hand. I sprang upon her in the instant, but not quickly enough to stop her from hiding the knife. Without a word from me, without a cry from her, I pinioned her in a chair. With one hand I felt up her sleeve, and there, where the dream woman had hidden the knife, my wife had hidden it, the knife with the buckhorn handle that looked like new. What I felt when I made that discovery I could not realize at the time, and I can't describe it now. I took one steady look at her with the knife in my hand. You meant to kill me, I said. Yes, she answered. I meant to kill you. She crossed her arms over her bosom and stared me coolly in the face. I shall do it yet, she said, with that knife. I don't know what possessed me. I swear to you I am no coward. And yet I acted like a coward. The horrors got hold of me. I couldn't look at her. I couldn't speak to her. I left her with the knife in my hand and went out into the night. There was a bleak wind abroad, and the smell of rain was in the air. The church clocks chimed the quarter as I walked beyond the last house in the town. I asked the first policeman I met what hour that was, of which the quarter had just been struck. The man looked at his watch and answered, Two o'clock. Two in the morning. What day of the month was this day that had just begun? I reckoned it up from the date of my mother's funeral. The horrid parallel between the dream and the reality was complete. It was my birthday. Had I escaped the mortal peril which the dream foretold, or had I only received a second warning? As that doubt crossed my mind, I stopped on my way out of the town. The air had revived me. I felt in some degree like my own self again. After a little thinking, I began to see plainly the mistake I had made in leaving my wife free to go where she liked and to do as she pleased. I turned instantly and made my way back to the house. It was still dark. I had left the candle burning in the bedchamber. When I looked up at the window of the room now, there was no light in it. I advanced to the house door. On going away, I remembered to have closed it. On trying it now, I found it open. I waited outside, never losing sight of the house till daylight. Then I ventured indoors, listened, and heard nothing. Looked into the kitchen, scullery, parlor, and found nothing. Went up at last into the bedroom. It was empty. A picklock lay on the floor, which told me how she had gained entrance in the night. And that was the one trace I could find of the dream woman. I waited in the house till the town was astir for the day, and then I went to consult a lawyer. 
in the confused state of my mind at the time i had one clear notion of what i meant to do i was determined to sell my house and leave the neighborhood there were obstacles in the way which i had not counted on i was told i had creditors to satisfy before i could leave i who had given my wife the money to pay my bills regularly every week Inquiry showed that she had embezzled every farthing of the money I had entrusted to her. I had no choice but to pay over again. Placed in this awkward position, my first duty was to set things right with the help of my lawyer. During my forced sojourn in the town, I did two foolish things, and as a consequence that followed, I heard once more, and heard for the last time, of my wife. In the first place, having got possession of the knife, I was rash enough to keep it in my pocket. In the second place, having something of importance to say to my lawyer, at a late hour of the evening I went to his house after dark, alone and on foot. I got there safely enough. Returning, I was seized on from behind by two men, dragged down a passage and robbed, not only of the little money I had about me, but also of the knife. It was the lawyer's opinion, as it was mine, that the thieves were among the disreputable acquaintances formed by my wife, and that they had attacked me at her instigation. To confirm this view, I received a letter the next day, without date or address, written in Alicia's hand. The first line informed me that the knife was back again in her possession. The second line reminded me of the day when I struck her. The third line warned me that she would wash out the stain of that blow in my blood, and repeated the words, I shall do it with the knife. These things happened a year ago. The law laid hands on the men who had robbed me, but from that time to this, the law has failed completely to find a trace of my wife. My story is told. When I had paid the creditors and paid the legal expenses, I had barely five pounds left out of the sale of my house, and I had the world to begin over again. Some months since, drifting here and there, I found my way to Underbridge. The landlord of the inn had known something of my father's family in times past. He gave me, all he had to give, my food, and shelter in the yard. Except on market days, there is nothing to do. In the coming winter, the inn is to be shut up, and I shall have to shift for myself. My old master would help me if I applied to him, but I don't like to apply. He has done more for me already than I deserve. Besides, in another year, who knows, but my troubles may all be at an end. Next winter will bring me nigh to my next birthday, and my next birthday may be the day of my death. Yes, it's true. I sat up all last night, and I heard two in the morning strike, and nothing happened. Still, allowing for that, the time to come is a time I don't trust. My wife has got the knife. My wife is looking for me. I am above superstition, mind. I don't say I believe in dreams... I only say Alicia Warlock is looking for me. It is possible I may be wrong. It is possible I may be right. Who can tell? End of section 19, part 3 of The Dream Woman. Recording by Leonard Wilson, Springfield, Ohio. Section 20 of Library of the World's Best Mystery and Detective Stories, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Cheryl Martin. Library of the World's Best Mystery and Detective Stories, Volume 2. By Julian Hawthorne. Editor. 
Section 20. The Dream Woman, Part 4, by Wilkie Collins. The Third Narrative. The Story Continued by Percy Fairbank. We took leave of Francis Raven at the door of Farley Hall, with the understanding that he might expect to hear from us again. The same night Mrs. Fairbank and I had a discussion in the sanctuary of our own room. The topic was the hostler story, and the question in dispute between us turned on the measure of charitable duty that we owed to the hostler himself. The view I took of the man's narrative was of the purely matter-of-fact kind, Francis Raven had, in my opinion, brooded over the misty connection between his strange dream and his vile wife until his mind was in a state of partial delusion on that subject. I was quite willing to help him with a trifle of money, and to recommend him to the kindness of my lawyer if he was really in any danger and wanted advice. There my idea of my duty toward this afflicted person began and ended." Confronted with this sensible view of the matter, Mrs. Fairbank's romantic temperament rushed, as usual, into extremes. "'I should no more think of losing sight of Francis Raven when his next birthday comes round,' says my wife, "'than I should think of laying down a good story with the last chapters unread. I am positively determined, Percy, to take him back with us when we return to France, in the capacity of groom.' What does one man more or less among the horses matter to people as rich as we are? In this strain the partner of my joys and sorrows ran on, perfectly impenetrable to everything that I could say on the side of common sense. Need I tell my married brethren how it ended? Of course I allowed my wife to irritate me, and spoke to her sharply. Of course my wife turned her face away indignantly on the conjugal pillow, and burst into tears. Of course, upon that, Mr. made his excuses, and Mrs. had her own way. Before the week was out, we rode over to Underbridge, and duly offered to Francis Raven a place in our service as supernumerary groom. At first, the poor fellow seemed hardly able to realize his own extraordinary good fortune. Recovering himself, he expressed his gratitude modestly and becomingly. Mrs. Fairbank's ready sympathies overflowed, as usual, at her lips. She talked to him about our home in France, as if the worn, grey-headed hostler had been a child. "'Such a dear old house, Francis, and such pretty gardens. Stables. Stables ten times as big as your stables here. Quite a choice of rooms for you. You must learn the name of our house, Maison Rouge. Our nearest town is Metz. We are within a walk of the beautiful River Moselle.' and when we want a change, we have only to take the railway to the frontier and find ourselves in Germany. Listening so far with a very bewildered face, Francis started and changed color when my wife reached the end of her last sentence. Germany, he repeated. Yes. Does Germany remind you of anything? The hostler's eyes looked down sadly on the ground. Germany reminds me of my wife, he replied. Indeed. How? She once told me she had lived in Germany, long before I knew her, in the time when she was a young girl. Was she living with relations or friends? She was living as a governess in a foreign family. In what part of Germany? I don't remember, ma'am. I doubt if she told me. Did she tell you the name of the family? Yes, ma'am. It was a foreign name, and it has slipped my memory long since. The head of the family was a wine-grower in a large way of business. I remember that. Did you hear what sort of wine he grew? There are wine-growers in our neighborhood. Was it Moselle wine? I couldn't say, ma'am. I doubt if I ever heard. There the conversation dropped. We engaged to communicate with Francis Raven before we left England, and took our leave. I had made arrangements to pay our round of visits to English friends, and to return to Maison Rouge in the summer. On the eve of departure, certain difficulties in connection with the management of some landed property of mine in Ireland obliged us to alter our plans. Instead of getting back to our house in France in the summer, we only returned a week or two before Christmas. 
Francis Raven accompanied us, and was duly established, in the nominal capacity of stable-keeper, among the servants at Maison Rouge. Before long, some of the objections to taking him into our employment, which I had foreseen and had vainly mentioned to my wife, forced themselves on our attention in no very agreeable form. Francis Raven failed, as I had feared he would, to get on smoothly with his fellow servants. They were all French, and not one of them understood English. Francis, on his side, was equally ignorant of French. His reserved manners, his melancholy temperament, his solitary ways, all told against him. Our servants called him the English Bear. He grew widely known in the neighborhood under his nickname. Quarrels took place, ending once or twice in blows. It became plain, even to Mrs. Fairbank herself, that some wise change must be made. While we were still considering what the change was to be, the unfortunate hostler was thrown on our hands for some time to come by an accident in the stables. Still pursued by his proverbial ill luck, the poor wretch's leg was broken by a kick from a horse. He was attended to by our own surgeon in his comfortable bedroom at the stables. As the date of his birthday drew near, he was still confined to his bed. Physically speaking, he was doing very well. Morally speaking, the surgeon was not satisfied. Francis Raven was suffering under some mysterious mental disturbance, which interfered seriously with his rest at night. Hearing this, I thought it my duty to tell the medical attendant what was preying on the patient's mind. As a practical man, he shared my opinion that the hostler was in a state of delusion on the subject of his wife and his dream. "'Curable delusion, in my opinion,' the surgeon added, "'if the experiment could be fairly tried.' "'How can it be tried?' I asked. Instead of replying, the surgeon put a question to me, on his side. "'Do you happen to know,' he said, "'that this year is leap year?' "'Mrs. Fairbank reminded me of it yesterday,' I answered. "'Otherwise I might not have known it. "'Do you think Francis Raven knows that this year is leap year?' I began to see dimly what my friend was driving at. "'It depends,' I answered, "'on whether he has got an English almanac. "'Suppose he has not got the almanac. "'What then?' "'In that case,' pursued the surgeon, "'Francis Raven is innocent of all suspicion "'that there is a twenty-ninth day in February this year. "'As a necessary consequence, what will he do? "'He will anticipate the appearance of the woman with the knife "'at two in the morning of the twenty-ninth of February "'instead of the first of March. "'Let him suffer all his superstitious terrors on the wrong day. "'Leave him on the day that is really his birthday "'to pass a perfectly quiet night.' and to be as sound asleep as other people at two in the morning. And then, when he wakes comfortably in time for his breakfast, shame him out of his delusion by telling him the truth. I agree to try the experiment. Leaving the surgeon to caution Mrs. Fairbank on the subject of leap year, I went to the stables to see Mr. Raven. The poor fellow was full of forebodings of the fate in store for him on the ominous first of March. He eagerly entreated me to order one of the men-servants to sit up with him on the birthday morning. In granting his request, I asked him to tell me on which day of the week his birthday fell. He reckoned the days on his fingers, and proved his innocence of all suspicion that it was leap year by fixing on the twenty-ninth of February, in the full persuasion that it was the first of March. Pledged to try the surgeon's experiment, I left his error uncorrected, of course. In so doing, I took my first step blindfold toward the last act in the drama of the hostler's dream. The next day brought with it a little domestic difficulty, which indirectly and strangely associated itself with the coming end. My wife received a letter, inviting us to assist in celebrating the silver wedding of two worthy German neighbors of ours, Mr. and Mrs. Beldheimer. Mr. Beldheimer was a large wine-grower on the banks of the Moselle. His house was situated on the frontier line of France and Germany, and the distance from our house was sufficiently considerable to make it necessary for us to sleep under our host's roof. 
Under these circumstances, if we accepted the invitation, a comparison of dates showed that we should be away from home on the morning of the 1st of March. Mrs. Fairbank, holding to her absurd resolution to see with her own eyes what might, or might not, happen to Francis Raven on his birthday, flatly declined to leave Maison Rouge. "'It's easy to send an excuse,' she said in her offhand manner. I failed, for my part, to see any easy way out of the difficulty. The celebration of a silver wedding in Germany is the celebration of twenty-five years of happy married life, and the host's claim upon the consideration of his friends on such an occasion is something in the nature of a royal command. After considerable discussion, finding my wife's obstinacy invincible, and feeling that the absence of both of us from the festival would certainly offend our friends, I left Mrs. Fairbank to make her excuses for herself, and directed her to accept the invitation so far as I was concerned. In so doing, I took my second step, blindfold, toward the last act in the drama of the hostler's dream. A week elapsed. The last days of February were at hand. Another domestic difficulty happened, and again, this event also proved to be strangely associated with the coming end. My head groom at the stables was one Joseph Rigobert. He was an ill-conditioned fellow, inordinately vain of his personal appearance, and by no means scrupulous in his conduct with women. His one virtue consisted of his fondness for horses, and in the care he took of the animals under his charge. In a word, he was too good a groom to be easily replaced, or he would have quitted my service long since." On the occasion of which I am now writing, he was reported to me by my steward as growing idle and disorderly in his habits. The principal offense alleged against him was that he had been seen that day in the city of Metz, in the company of a woman, supposed to be an English woman, whom he was entertaining at a tavern when he ought to have been on his way back to Maison Rouge. The man's defense was that the lady, as he called her, was an English stranger, unacquainted with the ways of the place, and that he had only shown her where she could obtain some refreshments at her own request. I administered the necessary reprimand, without troubling myself to inquire further into the matter. In failing to do so, I took my third step, blindfold, toward the last act in the drama of The Hostler's Dream. Joseph Rigobert immediately volunteered for the duty, as a means, no doubt, of winning his way back to my favor. I accepted his proposal. That day the surgeon dined with us. Toward midnight he and I left the smoky room and repaired to Francis Raven's bedside. Rigobert was at his post, with no very agreeable expression on his face. The Frenchman and the Englishman had evidently not got on well together so far. Francis Raven lay helpless on his bed, waiting silently for two in the morning and the dream woman. "'I have come, Francis, to bid you good night,' I said cheerfully. "'Tomorrow morning I shall look in at breakfast time, before I leave home on a journey.' "'Thank you for all your kindness, sir. You will not see me alive tomorrow morning. She will find me this time. Mark my words. She will find me this time.' "'My good fellow, she couldn't find you in England.' How in the world is she to find you in France? It's borne in on my mind, sir, that she will find me here. At two in the morning, on my birthday, I shall see her again, and see her for the last time. Do you mean that she will kill you? I mean that, sir, she will kill me, with the knife. And with Rigobert in the room to protect you? I am a doomed man. Fifty Rigoberts couldn't protect me. "'And you wanted somebody to sit up with you?' "'Mere weakness, sir. I don't like to be left alone on my deathbed.' "'I looked at the surgeon. If he had encouraged me, I should certainly, out of sheer compassion, "'have confessed to Francis Raven the trick that we were playing him. "'The surgeon held to his experiment. The surgeon's face plainly said, "'No.' "'The next day, the twenty-ninth of February, was the day of the Silver Wedding.' The first thing in the morning I went to Francis Raven's room. Rigobert met me at the door. 
"'How has he passed the night?' I asked. "'Saying his prayers and looking for ghosts,' Rigobert answered. "'A lunatic asylum is the only proper place for him.' I approached the bedside. "'Well, Francis, here you are, safe and sound, in spite of what you said to me last night.' His eyes rested on mine with a vacant, wondering look. "'I don't understand it,' he said. "'Did you see anything of your wife when the clock struck two? "'No, sir. Did anything happen? "'Nothing happened, sir. "'Doesn't this satisfy you that you were wrong?' "'His eyes still kept their vacant, wondering look. "'He only repeated the words he had spoken already. "'I don't understand it. "'I made a last attempt to cheer him. "'Come, come, Francis, keep a good heart. "'You'll be out of bed in a fortnight.' He shook his head on the pillow. "'There's something wrong,' he said. "'I don't expect you to believe me, sir. "'I only say there's something wrong, and time will show it.' I left the room. Half an hour later I started for Mr. Beldheimer's house, leaving the arrangements for the morning of the 1st of March in the hands of the doctor and my wife. The one thing which principally struck me when I joined the guests at the silver wedding is also the one thing which it is necessary to mention here. On this joyful occasion, a noticeable lady present was out of spirits. That lady was no other than the heroine of the festival, the mistress of the house. In the course of the evening, I spoke to Mr. Beldheimer's eldest son on the subject of his mother. As an old friend of the family, I had a claim on his confidence which the young man willingly recognized. "'We have had a very disagreeable matter to deal with,' he said, "'and my mother has not recovered the painful impression left on her mind. "'Many years since, when my sisters were children, "'we had an English governess in the house. "'She left us, as we then understood, to be married. "'We heard no more of her until a week or ten days since, "'when my mother received a letter in which our ex-governess described herself as being in a condition of great poverty and distress. After much hesitation, she had ventured, at the suggestion of a lady who had been kind to her, to write to her former employers and to appeal to their remembrance of old times. You know my mother. She is not only the most kind-hearted, but the most innocent of women. It is impossible to persuade her of the wickedness that there is in the world." She replied by return of post, inviting the governess to come here and see her, and enclosing the money for her traveling expenses. When my father came home and heard what had been done, he wrote at once to his agent in London to make inquiries, enclosing the address on the governess's letter. Before he could receive the agent's reply, the governess arrived. She produced the worst possible impression on his mind. The agent's letter, arriving a few days later, confirmed his suspicions. Since we had lost sight of her, the woman had led a most disreputable life. My father spoke to her privately. He offered, on condition of her leaving the house, a sum of money to take her back to England. If she refused, the alternative would be an appeal to the authorities and a public scandal. She accepted the money and left the house. On her way back to England, she appears to have stopped at Metz. You will understand what sort of woman she is when I tell you that she was seen the other day in a tavern with your handsome groom, Joseph Rigobert. While my informant was relating these circumstances, my memory was at work. I recalled what Francis Raven had vaguely told us of his wife's experience in former days as governess in a German family. A suspicion of the truth suddenly flashed across my mind. "'What was the woman's name?' I asked. Mr. Beldheimer's son answered, "'Alicia Warlock.' I had but one idea when I heard that reply, to get back to my house without a moment's needless delay. It was then ten o'clock at night. The last train to Metz had left long since. I arranged with my young friend, after duly informing him of the circumstances, that I should go by the first train in the morning.' instead of staying to breakfast with the other guests who slept in the house. At intervals during the night I wondered uneasily how things were going on at Maison Rouge. Again and again the same question occurred to me on my journey home in the morning, the morning of the 1st of March. As the event proved, but one person in my house knew what really happened at the stables on Francis Raven's birthday. 
Let Joseph Rigobert take my place as narrator, and tell the story of the end to you, as he told it in times past, to his lawyer and to me. Fourth and last narrative. Statement of Joseph Rigobert, addressed to the advocate who defended him at his trial. Respected Sir, on the 27th of February I was sent, on business connected with the stables at Maison Rouge, to the city of Metz. On the public promenade I met a magnificent woman, complexion blonde, nationality English. We mutually admired each other. We fell into conversation. She spoke French perfectly, with the English accent. I offered refreshment. My proposal was accepted. We had a long and interesting interview. We discovered that we were made for each other. So far, who is to blame? Is it my fault that I am a handsome man, universally agreeable as such to the fair sex? Is it a criminal offense to be accessible to the amiable weakness of love? I ask again, who is to blame? Clearly, nature. Not the beautiful lady. Not my humble self. To resume, the most hard-hearted person living will understand that two beings made for each other could not possibly part without an appointment to meet again. I made arrangements for the accommodation of the lady in the village near Maison Rouge. She consented to honor me with her company at supper, in my apartment at the stables, on the night of the twenty-ninth. The time fixed on was the time when the other servants were accustomed to retire, eleven o'clock. Among the grooms attached to the stables was an Englishman, laid up with a broken leg. His name was Francis. His manners were repulsive. He was ignorant of the French language. In the kitchen he went by the nickname of the English Bear. Strange to say, he was a great favorite with my master and my mistress. They even humored certain superstitious terrors to which this repulsive person was subject. Terrors into the nature of which I, as an advanced free thinker, never thought it worth my while to inquire. On the evening of the twenty-eighth, the Englishman, being a prey to the terrors which I have mentioned, requested that one of his fellow servants might sit up with him for that night only. The wish that he expressed was backed by Mr. Fairbank's authority. Having already incurred my master's displeasure, in what way a proper sense of my own dignity forbids me to relate, I volunteered to watch by the bedside of the English bear. My object was to satisfy Mr. Fairbank that I bore no malice, on my side, after what had occurred between us. The wretched Englishman passed a night of delirium. Not understanding his barbarous language, I could only gather from his gesture that he was in deadly fear of some fancied apparition at his bedside. From time to time, when this madman disturbed my slumbers, I quieted him by swearing at him. This is the shortest and best way of dealing with persons in his condition. On the morning of the twenty-ninth, Mr. Fairbank left us on a journey. Later in the day, to my unspeakable disgust, I found that I had not done with the Englishman yet. In Mr. Fairbank's absence, Mrs. Fairbank took an incomprehensible interest in the question of my delirious fellow-servant's repose at night. Again, one or the other of us was to watch at his bedside and report it if anything happened. Expecting my fair friend to supper, it was necessary to make sure that the other servants at the stables would be safe in their beds that night. Accordingly, I volunteered once more to be the man who kept watch. Mrs. Fairbank complimented me on my humanity. I possessed great command over my feelings. I accepted the compliment without a blush. Twice, after nightfall, my mistress and the doctor, the last staying in the house in Mr. Fairbank's absence, came to make inquiries. Once before the arrival of my fair friend, and once after. On the second occasion, my apartment being next door to the Englishman's, I was obliged to hide my charming guest in the harness room. She consented, with angelic resignation, to immolate her dignity to the servile necessities of my position. A more amiable woman, so far, I never met with. After the second visit I was left free. It was then close on midnight. 
Up to that time there was nothing in the behavior of the mad Englishman to reward Mrs. Fairbank and the doctor for presenting themselves at his bedside. He lay half awake, half asleep, with an odd wondering kind of look in his face. My mistress at parting warned me to be particularly watchful of him toward two in the morning. The doctor, in case anything happened, left me a large handbell to ring, which could easily be heard at the house. Restored to the society of my fair friend, I spread the supper table, a pâté, a sausage, and a few bottles of generous Moselle wine composed our simple meal. When persons adore each other, the intoxicating illusion of love transforms the simplest meal into a banquet. With immeasurable capacities for enjoyment, we sat down to table. At the very moment when I placed my fascinating companion in a chair, the infamous Englishman in the next room took that occasion of all others to become restless and noisy once more. He struck with his stick on the floor. He cried out in a delirious access of terror, Rigobert! Rigobert! The sound of that lamentable voice suddenly assailing our ears terrified my fair friend. She lost all her chiming color in an instant. Good heavens! she exclaimed. Who is that in the next room? A mad Englishman. An Englishman? Compose yourself, my angel. I will quiet him. The lamentable voice called out on me again. Rigobert! Rigobert! My fair friend caught me by the arm. Who is he? she cried. What is his name? Something in her face struck me as she put that question. A spasm of jealousy shook me to the soul. You know him? I said. His name, she vehemently repeated. His name. Francis, I answered. Francis what? I shrugged my shoulders. I could neither remember nor pronounce the barbarous English surname. I could only tell her it began with an R. She dropped back into the chair. Was she going to faint? No, she recovered, and more than recovered, her lost color. Her eyes flashed superbly. What did it mean? Profoundly as I understand women in general, I was puzzled by this woman. You know him? I repeated. She laughed at me. What nonsense! How should I know him? Go and quiet the wretch. My looking-glass was near. One glance at it satisfied me that no woman in her senses could prefer the Englishman to me. I recovered my self-respect. I hastened to the Englishman's bedside. The moment I appeared, he pointed eagerly toward my room. He overwhelmed me with a torrent of words in his own language. I made out, from his gestures and his looks, that he had, in some incomprehensible manner, discovered the presence of my guest, and, stranger still, that he was scared by the idea of a person in my room. I endeavored to compose him on the system which I have already mentioned. That is to say, I swore at him in my language. The result not proving satisfactory, I own I shook my fist in his face and left the bedchamber. Returning to my fair friend, I found her walking backward and forward in a state of excitement wonderful to behold. She had not waited for me to fill her glass. She had begun the generous Moselle in my absence. I prevailed on her with difficulty to place herself at the table. Nothing would induce her to eat. My appetite is gone, she said. Give me wine. The generous Moselle deserves its name, delicate on the palate, with prodigious body. The strength of this fine wine produced no stupefying effect on my remarkable guest. It appeared to strengthen and exhilarate her, nothing more. She always spoke in the same low tone, and always, turned the conversation as I might, brought it back with the same dexterity to the subject of the Englishman in the next room. In any other woman, this persistency would have offended me. My lovely guest was irresistible. I answered her questions with the docility of a child. She possessed all the amusing eccentricity of her nation. When I told her of the accident which confined the Englishman to his bed, she sprang to her feet. An extraordinary smile irradiated her countenance. She said, "'Show me the horse who broke the Englishman's leg. I must see that horse.' I took her to the stables. 
She kissed the horse. On my word of honor, she kissed the horse. That struck me. I said, You do know the man, and he has wronged you in some way. No, she would not admit it, even then. I kiss all beautiful animals, she said. Haven't I kissed you? With that charming explanation of her conduct, she ran back up the stairs. I only remained behind to lock the stable door again. When I rejoined her, I made a startling discovery. I caught her coming out of the Englishman's room. I was just going downstairs again to call you, she said. The man in there is getting noisy once more. The mad Englishman's voice assailed our ears once more. Rigobert! Rigobert! He was a frightful object to look at when I saw him this time. His eyes were staring wildly. The perspiration was pouring over his face. In a panic of terror he clasped his hands. He pointed up to heaven. By every sign and gesture that a man can make, he entreated me not to leave him again. I really could not help smiling. The idea of my staying with him and leaving my fair friend by herself in the next room? I turned to the door. When the mad wretch saw me leaving, he burst out into a screech of despair, so shrill that I feared it might awaken the sleeping servants. My presence of mind in emergencies is proverbial among those who know me. I tore open the cupboard in which he kept his linen, seized a handful of his handkerchiefs, gagged him with one of them, and secured his hands with the others. There was now no danger of his alarming the servants. After tying the last knot, I looked up. The door between the Englishman's room and mine was open. My fair friend was standing on the threshold, watching him as he lay helpless on the bed, watching me as I tied the last knot. "'What are you doing there?' I asked. "'Why did you open the door?' She stepped up to me and whispered her answer in my ear, with her eyes all the time upon the man on the bed. I heard him scream. "'Well, I thought you had killed him.' I drew back from her in horror. The suspicion of me which her words implied was sufficiently detestable in itself, but her manner when she uttered the words was more revolting still. It so powerfully affected me that I started back from that beautiful creature as I might have recoiled from a reptile crawling over my flesh. Before I had recovered myself sufficiently to reply, my nerves were assailed by another shock. I suddenly heard my mistress's voice calling to me from the stable-yard. There was no time to think. There was only time to act. The one thing needed was to keep Mrs. Fairbank from ascending the stairs and discovering— not my lady guest only, but the Englishman also, gagged and bound on his bed. I instantly hurried to the yard. As I ran down the stairs, I heard the stable clock strike the quarter to two in the morning. My mistress was eager and agitated. The doctor, in attendance on her, was smiling to himself, like a man amused at his own thoughts. "'Is Francis awake or asleep?' Mrs. Fairbank inquired. He has been a little restless, madam, but he is now quiet again. If he is not disturbed, I added those words to prevent her from ascending the stairs, he will soon fall off into a quiet sleep. Has nothing happened since I was here last? Nothing, madam. The doctor lifted his eyebrows with a comical look of distress. Alas, alas, Mrs. Fairbank, he said, nothing has happened. The days of romance are over. "'It is not two o'clock yet,' my mistress answered, a little irritably. "'The smell of the stables was strong on the morning air. "'She put her handkerchief to her nose "'and led the way out of the yard by the north entrance, "'the entrance communicating with the gardens and the house. "'I was ordered to follow her, along with the doctor. "'Once out of the smell of the stables, "'she began to question me again. "'She was unwilling to believe that nothing had occurred in her absence.' I invented the best answers I could think of on the spur of the moment, and the doctor stood by laughing. So the minutes passed till the clock struck two. Upon that, Mrs. Fairbank announced her intention of personally visiting the Englishman in his room. To my great relief, the doctor interfered to stop her from doing this. "'You have heard that Francis is just falling asleep,' he said. 
If you enter his room, you may disturb him. It is essential to the success of my experiment that he should have a good night's rest, and that he should own it himself, before I tell him the truth. I must request, madam, that you will not disturb the man. Rigobert will ring the alarm bell if anything happens. My mistress was unwilling to yield. For the next five minutes, at least, there was a warm discussion between the two. In the end, Mrs. Fairbank was obliged to give way, for the time. In half an hour, she said, Francis will either be sound asleep or awake again. In half an hour I shall come back. She took the doctor's arm. They returned together to the house. Left by myself, with half an hour before me, I resolved to take the Englishwoman back to the village, then, returning to the stables, to remove the gag and the bindings from Francis, and to let him screech to his heart's content. What would his alarming the whole establishment matter to me, after I had got rid of the compromising presence of my guest? Returning to the yard, I heard a sound like the creaking of an open door on its hinges. The gate of the north entrance I had just closed with my own hand. I went round to the west entrance, at the back of the stables. It opened on a field crossed by two footpaths in Mr. Fairbank's grounds. The nearest footpath led to the village. The other led to the high road and the river. Arriving at the west entrance, I found the door open, swinging to and fro slowly in the fresh morning breeze. I had myself locked and bolted that door after admitting my fair friend at eleven o'clock. A vague dread of something wrong stole its way into my mind. I hurried back to the stables. I looked into my own room. It was empty. I went to the harness room. Not a sign of the woman was there. I returned to my room and approached the door of the Englishman's bedchamber. Was it possible that she had remained there during my absence? An unaccountable reluctance to open the door made me hesitate, with my hand on the lock. I listened. There was not a sound inside. I called softly. There was no answer. I drew back a step, still hesitating. I noticed something dark moving slowly in the crevice between the bottom of the door and the boarded floor. Snatching up the candle from the table, I held it low and looked. The dark, slowly moving object was a stream of blood. That horrid sight roused me. I opened the door. The Englishman lay on his bed, alone in the room. He was stabbed in two places, in the throat and in the heart. The weapon was left in the second wound. It was a knife of English manufacture, with a handle of buckhorn as good as new. I instantly gave the alarm. Witnesses can speak to what followed. It is monstrous to suppose that I am guilty of the murder. I admit that I am capable of committing follies, but I shrink from the bare idea of a crime. Besides, I had no motive for killing the man. The woman murdered him in my absence. The woman escaped by the west entrance while I was talking to my mistress. I have no more to say. I swear to you, what I have here written is a true statement of all that happened on the morning of the 1st of March. Accept, sir, the assurance of my sentiments of profound gratitude and respect. Joseph Rigobert Last Lines Added by Percy Fairbank Tried for the murder of Francis Raven, Joseph Rigobert was found not guilty. The papers of the assassinated man presented ample evidence of the deadly animosity felt toward him by his wife. The investigations pursued on the morning when the crime was committed showed that the murderess, after leaving the stable, had taken the footpath which led to the river. The river was dragged, without result. It remains doubtful to this day whether she died by drowning or not. The one thing is certain is that Alicia Warlock was never seen again. So, beginning in mystery, ending in mystery, the dream woman passes from your view. Ghost, demon, or living human creature, say for yourselves which she is, or, knowing what unfathomed wonders are around you, what unfathomed wonders are in you, let the wise words of the greatest of all poets be explanation enough. We are such stuff as dreams are made of, 
and our little life is rounded with a sleep. End of section 20「as the Duchess returned, no, Your Grace. Knowles came farther into the room. He had a letter on a salver. When the Duke had taken it, Knowles still lingered. The Duke glanced at him. Is an answer required? No, Your Grace. Still Knowles lingered. Something a little singular has happened. The carriage has returned without the Duchess, and the men say that they thought Her Grace was in it. What do you mean? I hardly understand myself, Your Grace. Perhaps you would like to see Barnes. Barnes was the coachman. Send him up. When Knowles had gone, and he was alone, his grace showed signs of being slightly annoyed. He looked at his watch. I told her she'd better be in by four. She says she's not feeling well, and yet one would think that she's not aware of the fatigue entailed in having the prince come to dinner and a mob of people to follow. I particularly wished her to lie down for a couple of hours. Knowles ushered in not only Barnes, the coachman, but Moisey, the footman too. Both these persons seemed to be ill at ease. The Duke glanced at them sharply. In his voice there was a suggestion of impatience. What is the matter? Barnes explained as best he could. If you please, Your Grace, we waited for the Duchess outside Kane and Wilson's, the drapers. The Duchess got out, got into the carriage, and Moisey shut the door, and Her Grace said, Home, and yet when we got home, she wasn't there. She wasn't where? Her Grace wasn't in the carriage, Your Grace. What on earth do you mean? Her Grace did get into the carriage. You shut the door, didn't you? Barnes turned to Moisey. Moisey brought his hand up to his brow in a sort of military salute. He had been a soldier in the regiment in which, once upon a time, the Duke had been a subaltern. She did. The Duchess came out of the shop. She seemed rather in a hurry, I thought. She got into the carriage, and she said, Home, Moisey. I shut the door, and Barnes drove straight home. We never stopped anywhere and we never noticed anything happen on the way. And yet, when we got home, the carriage was empty. The Duke started. Do you mean to tell me that the Duchess got out of the carriage while you were driving full pelt through the streets without saying anything to you and without you noticing it? The carriage was empty when we got home, Your Grace. Was either of the doors open? No, Your Grace. You fellows have been up to some infernal mischief, and you've made a mess of it. You never picked up the Duchess, and you're trying to palm this tale off on me to save yourselves. Barnes was moved to adjuration. I'll take my Bible oath, Your Grace, that the Duchess got into the carriage outside Cana Wilson's. Moisey seconded his colleague. I'll swear to that, Your Grace. She got into that carriage, and I shut the door, and she said, Home, Moisey. The Duke looked as if he did not know what to make of the story and its tellers. What carriage did you have? Her Grace's brougham, Your Grace. Knowles interposed. The brougham was ordered because I understood that the Duchess was not feeling very well, and there's rather a high wind, Your Grace. The Duke snapped at him. What's that to do with it? Are you suggesting that the Duchess was more likely to jump out of a brougham while it was dashing through the streets than out of any other kind of vehicle? The Duke's glance fell on the letter which Knowles had brought him when he first had entered. He had placed it on his dressing table. Now he took it up. It was addressed, To His Grace, the Duke of Datchet, private, very pressing. The name was written in a fine, clear, almost feminine hand. The words in the left-hand corner of the envelope were written in a different hand. They were large and bold, almost as though they had been painted with the end of a pen holder instead of being written with the pen. The envelope itself was of an unusual size and bulged out as though it contained something else besides a letter. The Duke tore the envelope open. As he did so, something fell out of it onto the writing table. It looked as though it was a lock of a woman's hair. As he glanced at it, the Duke seemed to be a trifle startled. The Duke read the letter. Your Grace will be so good as to bring five hundred pounds in gold to the Piccadilly end of Burlington Arcade within an hour of the receipt of this. 
the Duchess of Datchet has been kidnapped. An imitation duchess got into the carriage which was waiting outside Kane and Wilson's, and she alighted on the road. Unless your grace does as you were requested, the Duchess of Datchet's left-hand little finger will be cut off and sent home in time to receive the prince to dinner. Other portions of her grace will follow. A lock of her grace's hair is enclosed with this as an earnest to our good intentions. Before 5.30 p.m., your grace is requested to be at the Piccadilly end of the Burlington Arcade with 500 pounds in gold. You will there be accosted by an individual in a white top hat and with a gardenia in his buttonhole. You will be entirely at liberty to give him into custody or to have him followed by the police, in which case the Duchess's left arm, cut off at the shoulder, will be sent home for dinner, not to mention other extremely possible contingencies. But you are advised to give the individual in question the 500 pounds in gold, because in that case the Duchess herself will be home in time to receive the prince to dinner, and with one of the best stories with which to entertain your distinguished guests they've ever heard. Remember, not later than 5.30, unless you wish to receive her grace's little finger. The duke stared at this amazing epistle when he had read it, as though he found it difficult to believe the evidence of his eyes. He was not a demonstrative person, as a rule. But this little communication astonished even him. He read it again. Then his hands dropped to his sides, and he swore. He took up the lock of hair which had fallen out of the envelope. Was it possible that it could be his wife's, the Duchess's? Was it possible that a Duchess of Datchet could be kidnapped in broad daylight in the heart of London and be sent home, as it were, in pieces? Had sacrilegious hands already been playing pranks with that great lady's hair? Certainly that hair was so like her hair that the mere resemblance made his grace's blood run cold. He turned on Messrs. Barnes and Moisey as though he would have liked to have rend them. You scoundrels! He moved towards as though the intention had entered his ducal heart to knock his servants down. But if that were so, he did not act quite upon his intention. Instead, he stretched out his arm, pointing at them as if he were an accusing spirit. Will you swear that it was the Duchess who got into the carriage outside Cane and Wilson's? Barnes began to stammer. I'll swear, Your Grace, that I, I thought... The Duke stormed an interruption. I don't ask what you thought. I ask you, will you swear that it was? The Duke's anger was more than Barnes could face. He was silent. Moisey showed a greater courage. I could have sworn that it was at the time, Your Grace, but now it seems to me that it's a rummy go. A rummy go! The peculiarity of the phrase did not seem to strike the Duke just then. At least he echoed it as if it didn't. You call it a rummy go! Do you know that I am told in this letter that the woman who entered the carriage was not the Duchess? What were you thinking about, or what case you will be able to make out for yourselves, you know better than I, but I can tell you this, that in an hour you will leave my service, and you may esteem yourselves fortunate tonight, if you are not both sleeping in jail. One might almost have suspected that the words were spoken in irony, but before they could answer, another servant entered, who also brought a letter for the Duke. When his grace's glance fell on it, he uttered an exclamation. The writing on the envelope was the same writing that had been on the envelope which had contained the very singular communication, like it in all respects, down to the broomstick and thickness of the private and very pressing in the corner. Who brought this, stormed the Duke. The servant appeared to be a little started by the violence of his grace's manner. A lady, or at least your grace, she seemed to be a lady. Where is she? She came in a hansom, your grace. She gave me that letter and said, Give that to the Duke of Datchet at once, without a moment's delay. Then she got into the hansom again and drove away. Why didn't you stop her, Your Grace? The man seemed surprised, as though the idea of stopping chance visitors to the ducal mansion by at Armis had not, until this moment, entered into his philosophy. The Duke continued to regard the man as if he could say a good deal if he chose. Then he pointed to the door. His lips said nothing but his gesture much. The servant vanished. Another hoax, the Duke said grimly as he tore the envelope open. This time the envelope contained a sheet of paper, and in the sheet of paper another envelope. The Duke unfolded the sheet of paper. On it some words were written, these. 
The Duchess appears so particularly anxious to drop you a line that one really hasn't the heart to refuse her. Her Grace's communication, written amidst blinding tears, you will find enclosed with this. Knowles, said the Duke, in a voice which actually trembled. Knowles, hoax or no hoax, I will be even with the gentleman who wrote that. Handing the sheet of paper to Mr. Knowles, his grace turned his attention to the envelope which had been enclosed. It was a small, square envelope of the finest quality, and it reeked with perfume. The Duke's countenance assumed an added frown. He had no fondness for envelopes which were scented. In the center of the envelope were the words to the Duke of Datchet, written in big, bold, sprawling hand which he knew so well. Maybell's writing, he said half to himself, as with shaking fingers he tore the envelope open. The sheet of paper which he took out was almost as stiff as cardboard. It too emitted what his grace deemed the nauseous odors of the perfumer's shop. On it was written this letter. My dear Hereward, for heaven's sake, do what these people require. I don't know what has happened or where I am, but I am nearly distracted. They have already cut off some of my hair, and they tell me that if you don't let them have five hundred pounds in gold by half-past five, they will cut off my little finger, too. I would sooner die than lose my little finger, and I don't know what else besides. But the token which I send you, and which has never until now been off my breast, I conjure you to help me. Hereward, help me. When he read that letter, the Duke turned white, very white, as white as the paper on which it was written. He passed the epistle on to Knowles. I suppose that is also a hoax. Mr. Knowles was silent. He still yielded to his constitutional disrelish to commit himself. At last he asked, What is it that your grace proposes to do? The Duke spoke with a bitterness which almost suggested a personal animosity towards the inoffensive Mr. Knowles. I propose, with your permission, to release the Duchess from the custody of my estimable correspondent. I propose, always with your permission, to comply with his modest request and to take him his five hundred pounds in gold. He paused and continued in a tone which, coming from him, meant volumes. Afterwards, I propose to cry quits with the concoctor of this penny hoax, even if it cost me every penny I possess. He shall pay more for that five hundred pounds than he supposes. The Duke of Datchet, coming out of the bank, lingered for a moment on the steps. In one hand, he carried a canvas bag which seemed well-weighted. On his countenance, there was an expression which, to the casual observer, might have suggested that his grace was not completely at his ease. That casual observer happened to come strolling by. It took the form of Ivor Dacker. Mr. Dacker looked at the Duke of Datchet up and down in that languid way he has. He perceived the canvas bag. Then he remarked, possibly intending to be facetious, Been robbing the bank? Shall I call a cart? Nobody minds what Ivor Dacker says. Besides, he is the Duke's own cousin. Perhaps a little removed. Still, there it is. So the Duke smiled a sickly smile, as if Mr. Dacker's delicate wit had given him a passing touch of indigestion. Mr. Dacker noticed that the Duke looked sallow, so he gave his petty sense of humor another airing. Kitchen boiler burst? When I saw the Duchess just now, I wondered if it had. His grace distinctly started. He almost dropped the canvas bag. You saw the Duchess just now, Ivor? When? The Duke was evidently moved. Mr. Dacker was stirred to languid curiosity. Can't say I clocked it. Perhaps half an hour ago? Perhaps a little more? Half an hour ago? Are you sure? Where did you see her? Mr. Dacker wondered. The Duchess of Datchet could scarcely have been eloping in broad daylight. Moreover, she had not been married a year. Everyone knew that she and the Duke were still as fond of each other as if they were not man and wife. So although the Duke, for some cause or another, was evidently in an odd state of agitation, Mr. Dacker saw no reason why he should not make a clean breast of all he knew. She was going like blazes in a handsome cab. In a handsome cab? Where? Down Waterloo Place. Was she alone? Mr. Dacker reflected. He glanced at the Duke out of the corners of his eyes. His languid utterance became a positive drawl, or rather fancy that she wasn't. Who was with her? My dear fellow, if you were to offer me the bank, I couldn't tell you. Was it a man? Mr. Dacker's drawl became still more pronounced, or rather fancy that it was. Mr. Dacker expected something. The Duke was so excited, but he by no means expected what actually came. Ivor, she's been kidnapped! 
Mr. Dacre did what he had never been known to do before within the memory of man. He dropped his eyeglasses. Dash it! She has! Some scoundrel has decoyed her away and trapped her. He's already sent me a lock of her hair, and he tells me that if I don't let him have five hundred pounds in gold by half-past five, he'll let me have her little finger. Mr. Dacre did not know what to make of his grace at all. He was a sober man. It couldn't be that. Mr. Dacre felt really concerned. I'll call a cab, old man. You better let me see you home. Mr. Dacre half raised his stick to hail a passing hansom. The duke caught him by the arm. You ass! What do you mean? I'm telling you the simple truth. My wife's been kidnapped. Mr. Dacre's countenance was a thing to be seen and remembered. Oh, I hadn't heard that there was much of that sort of thing about just now. They talk of poodles being kidnapped, but as for duchesses, you'd really better let me call that cab. Ivor, do you want me to kick you? Don't you see that to me it's a question of life or death? I've been in there to get the money. His grace motioned towards the bank. I'm going to take it to the scoundrel who has my darling at his mercy. Let me but have her hand in mine again, and he shall continue to pay for every sovereign with tears of blood until he dies. Look here, Datchet. I don't know if you're having a joke with me or if you're not well, but Duke stepped impatiently into the roadway. Ivor, you're a fool. Can't you tell just from earnest health from disease I'm off? Are you coming with me? It would be as well as that I should have a witness. Where are you off to? To the other end of the arcade. Who is the gentleman you expect to have the pleasure of meeting there? How should I know? The Duke took a letter from his pocket. It was the letter which had just arrived. The fellow is to wear a white top hat and a gardenia in his buttonhole. What is it that you have there? It's the letter which brought the news. Look for yourself and see, but for God's sakes make haste. His grace looked at his watch. It's already twenty after five. What do you mean to say that on the strength of a letter such as this you are going to hand over five hundred pounds to? The Duke cut Mr. Dacker short. What are five hundred pounds to me? Besides, you don't know it all. There's another letter. And I have heard from Mabel. But I will tell you all about it later. If you are coming, come. Folding up the letter, Mr. Dacker returned it to the Duke. As you were saying, what are five hundred pounds to you? It's as well they are not as much to you as they are to me, or I'm afraid. Hang it, Ivor! Do prose afterwards! The Duke hurried across the road. Mr. Dacker hastened afterwards. As they entered the arcade, they passed a constable. Mr. Dacker touched his companion's arm. Don't you think we'd better ask our friend in blue to walk behind us? His neighborhood might be handy. Nonsense, the Duke stopped short. Ivor, this is my affair, not yours. If you are not content to play the part of silent witness, be so good as to leave me. My dear Datchet, I am entirely at your service. I can be every whit as insane as you, I do assure you. Side by side, they moved rapidly down the Burlington Arcade. The Duke was obviously in a state of the extremest nervous tension. Mr. Dacker was equally obviously in a state of most supreme enjoyment. People stared as they rushed past. The Duke saw nothing. Mr. Dacker saw everything and smiled. When they reached the Piccadilly end of the arcade, the Duke pulled up. He looked about him. Mr. Dacker also looked about him. I see nothing of your white-headed and gardenia buttonholed friend, said Ivor. The Duke referred to his watch. It's not yet half-past five. I'm up to time. Mr. Dacker held his stick in front of him and leaned on it. He indulged himself with a beatific smile. It strikes me, my dear Datchet, that you've been the victim of one of the finest things in hoaxes. I hope I haven't kept you waiting. The voice which interrupted Mr. Dacker came from the rear. While they were looking in front of them, someone approached them from behind, apparently coming out of the shop which was at their backs. The speaker looked a gentleman. He sounded one, too. Costume, appearance, manner were beyond reproach, even beyond the criticism of two such keen critics as were these. The glorious attire of a London dandy was surmounted with a beautiful white top hat, and his buttonhole was a magnificent gardenia. In age, the stranger was scarcely more a boy, and sunny-faced, handsome boy at that. His cheeks were hairless, his eyes were blue. His smile was not only innocent, it was bland. Never was there a more conspicuous illustration of that repose which stamps the cast of Ver de Ver. The Duke looked at him and glowered. Mr. Dacker looked at him and smiled. Who are you? asked the Duke. Ah, that is the question. The newcomer's refined and musical voice breathed the very soul of affability. 
I am an individual who is so unfortunate as to be in want of five hundred pounds. Are you the scoundrel who sent me that infamous letter? The charming stranger never turned a hair. I am the scoundrel mentioned in that infamous letter who wants to accost you at the Piccadilly end of the Burlington Arcade before half past five, as witness my white hat and my gardenia. Where's my wife? The stranger gently swung his stick in front of him with his two hands. He regarded the duke as a merry-hearted son might regard his father. The thing was beautiful. Her grace will be home almost as soon as you are, and you have given me the money which I perceive you have already for me in that scarcely elegant-looking canvas bag. He shrugged his shoulders quite gracefully. Unfortunately, in these matters, one has no choice. One is forced to ask for gold. And suppose, instead of giving you what is in this canvas bag, I take you by the throat and choke the life right out of you. Or suppose, amended Mr. Dacker, that you do better and commend this gentleman to the tender mercies of the first policeman we encounter. The stranger turned to Mr. Dacker. He condescended to become conscious of his presence. Is this gentleman your grace's friend? Ah, Mr. Dacker, I perceive. I have the honor of knowing Mr. Dacker, though possibly I am unknown to him. You were, until this moment. With an airy little laugh, the stranger returned to the duke. He brushed an invisible speck of dust off the sleeve of his coat. As has been intimated in that infamous letter, his grace is at perfect liberty to give me into custody. Why not? Only, he said it with his boyish smile, if a particular communication is not received from me in certain quarters, within a certain time, the Duchess of Datchet's beautiful white arm will be hacked off at the shoulder. You hound! The duke would have taken the stranger by the throat and have done his best to choke the life right out of him then and there if Mr. Dacker had not intervened. Steady, old man, Mr. Dacker turned to the stranger. You appear to be a pretty sort of scoundrel. The Dacker gave his shoulders that almost imperceptible shrug. Ah, my dear Mr. Dacker, I am in want of money. I believe that you sometimes are in want of money, too. Everybody knows that nobody knows where Ivor Dacker gets his money from. So the illusion must have tickled him immensely. You're a cool hand, he said. Some men are born that way. So I should imagine. Men like you must be born, not made. Precisely, as you say. The stranger turned with his graceful smile to the duke. But we are not wasting precious time. I can assure your grace that, in this particular matter, moments are of value. Mr. Dacker interposed before the duke could answer. If you take my strongly urged advice, Datchet, you will summon this constable who is now coming down the arcade and hand this gentleman over to his keeping. I do not think that you need to fear that the Duchess will lose her arm or even her little finger. Scoundrels of this one's kidney are most amenable to reason when they have handcuffs on their wrists. The Duke plainly hesitated. He would, and he would not. The stranger, as he eyed him, seemed much amused. My dear Duke, by all means, act on Mr. Dacker's valuable suggestion. As I said before, why not? It would at least be interesting to see if the Duchess does or does not lose her arm. Almost as interesting to you as does Mr. Dacker. These blackmailing, kidnapping scoundrels do use such empty menaces. Besides, you would have the pleasure of seeing me locked up. My imprisonment for life would recompense you even for the loss of her grace's arm. And five hundred pounds is such a sum to have to pay, merely for a wife. Why not, therefore... Act on Mr. Dacker's suggestion. Here comes the constable. The constable referred to was advancing towards them. He was not a dozen yards away. Let me beckon to him. I will with pleasure. He took out his watch, a gold chronograph repeater. There are scarcely ten minutes left during which it will be possible for me to send the communication which I spoke of, so that it may arrive in time. As it will then be too late, and the instruments are already prepared for the little operation, which her grace is eagerly anticipating it would perhaps be as well, after all, that you would give me unto charge. You would have saved your five hundred pounds, and you would, at any rate, have something in exchange for her grace's mutilated limb. Ah, here's the constable. Officer! The stranger spoke with such a pleasant little air of easy geniality that it was impossible to tell if he was in jest or in earnest. This fact impressed the duke much more than if he had gone in for a liberal injustice of the, under the circumstances, 
orthodox melodramatic scowling. And indeed, in the face of his own common sense, it impressed Mr. Ivor Dacker, too. This well-bred, well-groomed youth was just the being to realize au beau des Anglais, a modern type of the devil, the type which depicts him as a perfect gentleman who keeps smiling all the time. The constable, whom this audacious rogue had signaled, approached the little group. He addressed the stranger. Do you want me, sir? No, I don't want you. I think it's the Duke of Datchet. The constable, who knew the Duke very well, by sight, saluted him as he turned to receive instructions. The Duke turned white, even savage. There was not a pleasant look in his eye and about his lip. He appeared to be endeavoring to put a great restraint upon himself. There was a momentary silence. Mr. Dacker made a movement as if to interpose, and the Duke caught him by the arm. He spoke. No, Constable, I do not want you. This person is mistaken. The Constable looked as if he could not quite make out how, how such a mistake could have arisen, hesitated, then, with another salute, he moved away. The stranger was still holding his watch in his hand. Only eight minutes, he said. The Duke seemed to experience some difficulty in giving utterance to what he had to say. If I give you this five hundred pounds, you, you, as the Duke paused as if a loss for language was strong enough to convey his meaning, the stranger laughed. Let us take the adjectives for granted. Besides, it is only boys who call each other names. Men do things. If you give me the bag, with five hundred sovereigns, which you have at once, in five minutes it'll be too late. I will promise, I will not swear, if you do not credit my single promise, you will not believe my solid affirmation. I will promise that possibly within an hour, certainly within an hour and a half, the Duchess of Datchet will return to you absolutely uninjured, except, of course, as you are already aware, with regards to the few of the hairs on her head. I will promise this on the understanding that you do not yourself attempt to see where I go and that you allow no one else to do so. This with a glance at Ivor Dacker. I shall know at once if I am being followed. If you entertain such intentions, you had better, on all accounts, remain in possession of your five hundred pounds. The Duke eyed him very grimly. I entertain no such intentions until the Duchess returns. Again, the stranger indulged in that musical laugh of his. <laughs> until the Duchess returns. Of course, then the bargain's at an end. When you are once more in the enjoyment of Her Grace's society, you will be at liberty to set all the dogs in Europe at my heels. I assure you, I fully expect that you will do so. Why not? The Duke raised the canvas bag. My dear Duke, ten thousand thanks. You will see Her Grace at Datchet's house, pawn my honor, probably within the hour. Well, commented Ivan Dacker when the Duke had vanished with the bag into Piccadilly and as the Duke and himself moved towards Burlington Gardens. If a gentleman is to be robbed, it is as well that he should have another gentleman rob him. End of section 21.
Section 22 of Library of the World's Best Mystery and Detective Stories, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by David Benjamin Goldstein. Library of the World's Best Mystery and Detective Stories, Volume 2, by Julian Hawthorne, Editor. The Lost Duchess by Anonymous, Part 3. Mr. Dacre eyed his companion covertly as they progressed. His grace of Datchet appeared to have some fresh cause for uneasiness. All at once he gave it utterance, in a tone of voice which was extremely somber. Ivor, do you think that scoundrel will dare to play me false? I think, murmured Mr. Dacre, that he has dared to play you pretty false already. I don't mean that. But I mean, how am I to know, now that he has his money, that he will still not keep Mabel in his clutches? There came an echo from Mr. Dacre. Just so. How are you to know? I believe that something of this sort has been done in the States. I thought that there they were content to kidnap them after they were dead. I was not aware, as they had, as yet, got quite so far as the living. I believe that I have heard of something just like this. Possibly. They are giants over there. And in that case, the scoundrels, when their demands were met, refused to keep to the letter of their bargain and asked for more. The duke stood still. He clinched his fists and swore. Ivor, if that villain doesn't keep his word and Mabel isn't home within the hour, by, I shall go mad. My dear Datchet, Mr. Dacre loved strong language as little as he loved a scene. Let us trust to time and a little to your white-hatted and gardenia buttonholed friend's word of honor. You should have thought of possible eventualities before you showed your confidence, really. Suppose instead of going mad, we first of all go home. A hansom stood waiting for a fare at the end of the arcade. Mr. Dacre had handed the duke into it before his grace had quite realized that the vehicle was there. Tell the fellow to drive faster. That was what the duke said when the cab had started. My dear Datchet, the man's already driving his gearage off its legs. If a bobby catches sight of him, he'll take his number. A moment later, a murmur from the duke. I don't know if you're aware that the prince is coming to dinner. I am perfectly aware of it. You take it uncommonly cool. How easy it is to bear our brother's burdens. Ivor, if Mabel doesn't turn up, I shall feel like murder. I sympathize with you, Datchet, with all my heart, though. I may observe parenthetically that I very far from realize the situation even yet. Take my advice. If the Duchess does not show quite as soon as we both of us desire, don't make a scene. Just let me see what I can do. Judging from the expression of his countenance, the Duke was conscious of no overwhelming desire to witness an exhibition of Mr. Dacre's prowess. When the cab reached Datchet House, his grace dashed up the steps three at a time. The door flew open. Has the Duchess returned? Herwood! A voice floated down from above. Someone came running down the stairs. It was her grace of Datchet. Mabel! She actually rushed into the Duke's extended arms, and he kissed her and she kissed him before the servants. "'So you're not quite dead?' she cried. "'I am, almost,' he said. She drew herself a little away from him. "'Herwood, were you seriously hurt?' "'Do you suppose that I could have been otherwise than seriously hurt?' "'My darling, was it a Pickford's van?' The Duke stared. A Pickford's van. I don't understand. But come in here. Come along, Ivor. Mabel, you don't see Ivor. How do you do, Mr. Dacre? Then the trio withdrew into a little anteroom. It was really time. Even then the pair conducted themselves as if Mr. Dacre had been nothing and no one. The Duke took the lady's two hands in his. He eyed her fondly. So you are uninjured, with the exception of that lock of hair. Where did the villain take it from? The lady looked a little puzzled. What lock of hair? 
From an envelope which he took from his pocket, the Duke produced a shining tress. It was the lock of hair which had arrived in the first communication. I will have it framed. You will have what framed? The Duchess glanced at what the Duke was so tenderly caressing, almost, as it seemed, a little dubiously. Whatever is it you have there? It is the lock of hair which that scoundrel sent me. Something in the lady's face caused him to ask a question. Didn't he tell you he had sent it to me? Her word. Did the brute tell you that he had meant to cut off your little finger? A very curious look came into the lady's face. She glanced at the duke as if she, all at once, was half afraid of him. She cast at Mr. Dacre what really seemed to be a look of inquiry. Her voice was tremulously anxious. Herward, did... did the accident affect you mentally? How could it not have affected me mentally? Do you think that my mental organization is of steel? But you look so well. Of course I look well, now that I have you back again. Tell me, darling, did that hound actually threaten you with cutting off your arm? If he did, I shall feel half inclined to kill him yet. The Duchess seemed positively to shrink from her better half's near neighborhood. Herward, was it a Pickford's van? The Duke seemed puzzled. Well, he might be. Was what a Pickford's van? The lady turned to Mr. Dacre. In her voice there was a ring of anguish. Mr. Dacre, tell me, was it a Pickford's van? Ivor could only imitate his relative's repetition of her inquiry. I don't quite catch you. Was what a Pickford's van? The Duchess clasped her hands in front of her. What is it you are keeping from me? What is it you are trying to hide? I implore you to tell me the worst, whatever it may be. Do not keep me any longer in suspense. You do not know what I have already endured. Mr. Dacre, is my husband mad? One need scarcely observe that the lady's amazing appeal to Mr. Dacre as to her husband's sanity was received with something like surprise. As the Duke continued to stare at her, a dreadful fear began to loom in his brain. My darling... Your brain is unhinged. He advanced to take her two hands again in his, but to his unmistakable distress she shrank away from him. Herward, don't touch me. How is it that I missed you? Why did you not wait until I came? Wait until you came. The Duke's bewilderment increased. Surely if your injuries turned out after all to be slight, that was all the more reason why you should have waited after sending for me like that. I sent for you. I... The duke's tone was grave. My darling, perhaps you had better come upstairs. Not until we have had an explanation. You must have known that I should come. Why did you not wait for me after you had sent me that? The duchess held out something to the duke. He took it. It was a card, his own visiting card. Something was written on the back of it. He read aloud what was written. Mabel, come to me at once with the bearer. They tell me they cannot take me home. It looks like my own writing. Looks like it? It is your writing. It looks like it, and written with a shaky pen. My dear child, one's hand would shake at such a moment as that. Mabel, where did you get this? It was brought to me in Cane and Wilson's. Who brought it? Who brought it? Why, the man you sent. The man I sent. A light burst upon the Duke's brain. He fell back a pace. It's the decoy. Her grace echoed the words. The decoy? The scoundrel, to set a trap with such a bait. My poor innocent darling, did you think it came from me? Tell me, Mabel, where did he cut off your hair? Cut off my hair? Her grace put her hand to her head as if to make sure that her hair was there. Where did he take you to? He took me to Draper's Buildings. Draper's Buildings. I have never been in the city before, but he told me it was Draper's Buildings. Isn't that near the Stock Exchange? Near the Stock Exchange? It seemed rather a curious place to which to take a kidnapped victim. The man's audacity. 
He told me that you were coming out of the stock exchange when a van knocked you over. He said that he thought it was a Pickford's van. Was it a Pickford's van? No, it was not a Pickford's van. Mabel, were you in Draper's building when you wrote that letter? Wrote what letter? Have you forgotten it already? I do not believe there is a word in it which will not be branded on my brain until I die. Herward, what do you mean? Surely you cannot have written me such a letter as that and then have forgotten it already. He handed her the letter which had arrived in the second communication. She glanced at it askance. Then she took it with a little gasp. Herward, if you don't mind, I think I'll take a chair. She took a chair. Whatever, whatever's this? As she read the letter, the varying expressions which passed across her face were, in themselves, a study in psychology. Is it possible that you can imagine that under any conceivable circumstances I could have written such a letter as this? Mabel? She rose to her feet with emphasis. Herward, don't say that you thought this came from me. Not from you. He remembered Knowles' diplomatic reception of the epistle on its first appearance. I suppose that you will say next that this is not a lock of your hair. My dear child, what bee have you got in your bonnet? This a lock of my hair? Why, it's not in the least bit like my hair. Which was certainly inaccurate. As far as color was concerned, it was an almost perfect match. The Duke turned to Mr. Dacre. Ivor, I've had to go through a good deal this afternoon. If I have to go through much more, something will crack. He touched his forehead. I think it's my turn to take a chair. Not the one what the Duchess had vacated, but one which faced it. He stretched out his legs in front of him. He thrust his hands into his trouser pockets. He said in a tone which was not gloomy, but absolutely gruesome, Might I ask you, Mabel, if you have been kidnapped? Kidnapped? The word I used was kidnapped. But I will spell it out, if you like, or I will get a dictionary that you may see its meaning. The Duchess looked as if she was beginning to be not quite sure if she was awake or sleeping. She turned to Ivor. Mr. Dacre, has the accident affected Herward's brain? The Duke took the words out of his cousin's mouth. On that point, my dear, let me ease your mind. I don't know if you are under the impression that I should be the same shape after a Pickford's van had run over me as I was before, but in any case I have not been run over by a Pickford's van. So far as I am concerned, there has been no accident. Dismiss that delusion from your mind. Oh, you appear surprised. One might even think that you were sorry. But may I now ask what you did when you arrived at Draper's Buildings? Did? I looked for you. Indeed. And when you had looked in vain, what was the next item in your program? The lady shrank still farther from him. Herward, have you been having a jest at my expense? Can you have been so cruel? Tears stood in her eyes. Rising, the duke laid his hand upon her arm. Mabel, tell me. What did you do when you had looked for me in vain? I looked for you upstairs and downstairs and everywhere. It was quite a large place. It took me ever such a time. I thought that I should go distracted. Nobody seemed to know anything about you or even that there had been an accident at all. It was all offices. I couldn't make it out in the least, and the people didn't seem to be able to make me out either. So, when I couldn't find you anywhere... I came straight home again. The Duke was silent for a moment. Then, with funereal gravity, he turned to Mr. Dacre. He put to him this question. Ivor, what are you laughing at? Mr. Dacre drew his hand across his mouth with a rather suspicious gesture. My dear fellow, it was only a smile. The Duchess looked from one to the other. What have you two been doing? What is the joke? With an air of preternatural solemnity, the Duke took two letters from the breast pocket of his coat. Mabel, 
You have already seen your letter. You have already seen the lock of your hair. Just look at this and that. He gave her the two very singular communications which had arrived in such a mysterious manner and so quickly one after the other. She read them with wide open eyes. Herward, wherever did these come from? The Duke was standing with his legs apart and his hands in his trousers' pockets. I would give another five hundred pounds to know. Shall I tell you, madam, what I have been doing? I have been presenting five hundred golden sovereigns to a perfect stranger, with a top hat and a gardenia in his buttonhole. Whatever for? If you have perused those documents which you have in your hand, you will have some faint idea. Ivor, when it's your funeral, I'll smile. Mabel, Duchess of Datchet, it is beginning to dawn upon the vacuum which represents my brain that I have been the victim of one of the prettiest things in practical jokes that ever yet was planned. When that fellow brought you that card at Canaan Wilson's, which, I need scarcely tell you, never came from me, someone walked out of the front entrance who was so exactly like you that both Barnes and Moisey took her for you. Moisey showed her into the carriage, and Barnes drove her home. But when the carriage reached home, it was empty. Your double had gotten out upon the road. The Duchess uttered a sound which was half gasp, half sigh. Herward! Barnes and Moisey, with beautiful and childlike innocence, when they found out that they had brought the thing home empty, came straight away and told me that you had jumped out of the brougham while it had been driving full pelt through the streets. While I was digesting that piece of information, there came the first epistle, with the lock of your hair. Before I had time to digest that, there came the second epistle, with yours inside. It seems incredible. It sounds incredible, but unfathomable is the folly of man, especially of a man who loves his wife. The Duke crossed to Mr. Dacre. I don't want Ivor to suggest anything in the way of bribery and corruption, but if you could keep this matter to yourself and not mention it to your friends, our white-hatted and gardenia buttonholed acquaintance is welcome to his five hundred pounds, and... Mabel... What on earth are you laughing at? The Duchess appeared all at once to be seized with inextinguishable laughter. Herward, she cried, just think how that man must be laughing at you. And the Duke of Datchet thought of it. End of section 22《Section 23 of Library of the World's Best Mystery and Detective Stories, Volume 2. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Bill Cisna. Library of the World's Best Mystery and Detective Stories, Volume 2. By Julian Hawthorne, Editor. Section 23. The Minor Canon by Anonymous It was Monday, and in the afternoon as I was walking along the high street of Marchbury, I was met by a distinguished-looking person whom I had observed at the services in the cathedral on the previous day. Now it chanced on that Sunday that I was singing the service. Properly speaking, it was not my turn. But as my brother minor canons were either away from Marchbury or ill in bed, I was the only one left to perform the necessary duty. The distinguished-looking person was a tall, big man with a round, fat face and small features. His eyes, his hair and mustache, his face was bare but for a small mustache, were quite black, and he had a very pleasant and genial expression. He wore a tall hat, set rather jauntily on his head, and he was dressed in black with a long frock coat buttoned across the chest and fitting him close to the body. As he came, with a half-saunter, half-swagger along the street, I knew him again at once by his appearance, and as he came nearer, 
I saw from his manner that he was intending to stop and speak to me, for he slightly raised his hat, and in a soft, melodious voice with a colonial twang, which was far from being disagreeable, and which, indeed, to my ear, gave a certain additional interest to his remarks, he saluted me with, "'Good day, sir.' "'Good day,' I answered, with just a little reserve in my tone. "'I hope, sir,' he began, "'you will excuse my stopping you in the street, but I wish to tell you how very much I enjoyed the music at your cathedral yesterday. I am an Australian, sir, and we have no such music in my country.' "'I suppose not.' I said. No, sir, he went on, nothing nearly so fine. I am very fond of music, and as my business brought me in this direction, I thought I would stop at your city and take the opportunity of paying a visit to your grand cathedral. And I am delighted I came, so pleased indeed that I should like to leave some memorial of my visit behind me. I should like, sir, to do something for your choir." "'I am sure it is very kind of you,' I replied. "'Yes, I should certainly be glad if you could suggest to me something I might do in this way. As regards money, I must say that I have plenty of it. I am the owner of a most valuable property. My business relations extend throughout the world, and if I am as fortunate in the projects of the future as I have been in the past, I shall probably one day achieve the proud position of being the richest man in the world. I did not like to undertake myself the responsibility of advising or suggesting, so I simply said, I cannot venture to say offhand what would be the most acceptable way of showing your great kindness and generosity, but I should certainly recommend you to put yourself in communication with the dean. Thank you, sir, said my Australian friend. I will do so. And now, sir, he continued, let me say how much I admire your voice. It is, without exception, the very finest and clearest voice I have ever heard. Really, I answered, quite overcome with such unqualified praise. Really, it is, it is very good of you to say so. Ah, but I feel it, my dear sir. I have been round the world from Sydney to Frisco, across the continent of America. He called it America to New York City, then on to England, and tomorrow I shall leave your city to continue my travels. But in all my experience, I have never heard so grand a voice as your own. This and a great deal more, he said, in the same strain, which modesty forbids me to reproduce. Now I am not without some knowledge of the world outside the close of Marchbury Cathedral, and I could not listen to such a flattering tale without having my suspicions aroused. Who and what is this man, thought I. I looked at him narrowly. At first the thought flashed across me that he might be a swell mobsman, but no, his face was too good for that. Besides, no man with that huge frame, that personality so marked and so easily recognizable, could be a swindler. He could not escape detection a single hour. I dismissed the ungenerous thought. Perhaps he is rich, as he says. We do hear of munificent donations by benevolent millionaires now and then. What if this Australian, attracted by the glories of the old cathedral, should now appear as a deus ex machina to re-endow the choir, or to found a musical professorate in connection with the choir, appointing me the first occupant of the professorial chair. These thoughts flashed across my mind in the momentary pause of his fluent tongue. As for yourself, sir, he began again, I have something to propose which I trust may not prove unwelcome. But the public street is hardly a suitable place to discuss my proposal. May I call upon you this evening at your house in the close? I know which it is, for I happened to see you go into it yesterday, after the morning service. I shall be very pleased to see you, I replied. We are going out to dinner this evening, but I shall be at home and disengaged till about seven. Thank you very much. Then I shall do myself the pleasure of calling upon you about six o'clock. Till then, farewell. 
a graceful wave of the hand, and my unknown friend had disappeared round the corner of the street. Now at last, I thought, something is going to happen in my uneventful life, something to break the monotony of existence. Of course, he must have inquired my name. He could get that from any of the cathedral vergers, and as he said, he had observed whereabouts in the clothes I lived. But I was not to see him again till six o'clock, and there were three good hours to wait. I recalled all that happened on the Sunday. It seemed as if some special providence was acting in my favor. It was due to the illness and absence of my colleagues that I had had the good fortune to officiate. Surely this was providential, and I am ashamed to say that I was in one way realizing the truth of the famous maxim of La Rochefoucauld in deriving a secret satisfaction from the misfortunes of my friends. Still, it was remarkable that it should happen thus. And it was undoubtedly true that on that particular Sunday I was an excellent voice. And then the vanity which is natural to all men asserted itself in me, and I found myself only too ready to believe that my voice was the finest and clearest ever heard. Somebody's must be the finest, and why not mine? My mysterious friend, whatever else he might be, was most certainly a man of good taste and judgment. That could not be denied. And then, as he had said, he was rich. Plenty of money, he said he had. What is he coming to see me for, I wondered. I spent the rest of the afternoon in making the wildest surmises. I was castle-building in Spain at a furious rate. At one time I imagined that this faithful son of the church, as he appeared to me, was going to build and endow a grand cathedral in Australia, on condition that I should be appointed dean at a yearly stipend of, say, ten thousand pounds. At another time I imagined him asking me to become his private chaplain at about the same remuneration. Again, I thought he might offer to educate my three boys at his own expense, provided that special attention should be given to the development of their natural musical genius. Or perhaps, I said to myself, he will beg me to accept a sum of money, I never thought of it as less than a thousand pounds, as a slight recognition of, and tribute to, my remarkable vocal ability. I confess I always came back to this last conjecture as the most probable. The others seemed rather wild in their fancifulness. I took a long, lonely walk into the country to correct these ridiculous fancies and to steady my mind, and when I reached home and had refreshed myself with a quiet cup of afternoon tea, I felt I was morally and physically prepared for my interview with the opulent stranger. Punctually as the cathedral clock struck six, there was a ring at the visitor's bell. In a moment or two, my unknown friend was shown into the drawing-room, which he entered with the easy air of a man of the world. I noticed he was carrying a small black bag. "'How do you do again, Mr. Dale?' he said as though we were old acquaintances. "'You see, I have come sharp to my time.' "'Yes,' I answered, "'and I am pleased to see you. Do sit down.' He sank into my best armchair and placed his bag on the floor beside him. Since we met this afternoon, he said, I have written a letter to your dean, expressing the great pleasure I felt in listening to your choir, and at the same time I enclosed a five-pound note, which I begged him to divide among the choir boys and men, from Alexander Poulter, Esquire, of Poulter's Pills. You have, of course, heard of the world-renowned Poulter's Pills. I am Poulter. Poulter of Poulter's Pills. My heart sank within me, a five-pound note. My airy castles were tottering. I also sent him a couple hundred of my pamphlets, which I said I trusted he would be so kind as to distribute in the close. I was aghast. And now, with regard to the special object of my call, Mr. Dale, if you will allow me to say so, you are not making the most of that grand voice of yours. You are hiding under an ecclesiastical bushel here, lost to the world. You are wasting your vocal strength and sweetness 
on the desert air, so to speak. Why, if I may hazard a guess, I don't suppose you make five hundred a year here at the outside. I could say nothing. Well, now, I can put you into the way of making at least three or four times as much as that. Listen, I am Alexander Poulter of Poulter's Pills. I have a proposal to make to you. The scheme is bound to succeed, but I want your help. Accept my proposal, and your fortune's made. Did you ever hear of Moody and Sankey? He asked abruptly. The man is an idiot, thought I. He is now fairly carried away with his particular mania. Will it last long? Shall I ring? Novelty, my dear sir, he went on, is the rule of the day, and there must be novelty in advertising, as in everything else, to catch the public interest. So I intend to go on a tour, lecturing on the merits of Poulter's pills in all the principal halls of all the principal towns all over the world but I have been delayed in carrying out my idea till I could associate myself with a gentleman such as yourself. Will you join me? I should be the moody of the tour. You would be its sankey. I would speak my patter, and you would intersperse my orations with melodious ballads, bearing upon the virtues of Poulter's pills. The ballads are all ready. So saying, he opened that bag and drew forth from its recesses nothing more alarming than a thick roll of manuscript music. The verses are my own, he said, with a little touch of pride. And as for the music, I thought it better to make use of popular melodies, so as to enable an audience to join in the chorus. See, here is one of the ballads. Darling, I am better now. It describes the woes of a fond lover, or rather his physical ailments, until he went through a course of poulter. Here's another. I'm ninety-five, I'm ninety-five. You catch the drift of that, of course. A healthy old age secured by taking poulter's pills. Ah, what's this? Little sister's last request. I fancy the idea of that is to beg the family never to be without poulter's pills. Here again. Then you'll remember me. I'm afraid that title is not original. Never mind, the song is. And here is. But there are many more, and I won't detain you with them now. He saw, perhaps, I was getting impatient. Thank heaven, however, he was no escaped lunatic. I was safe. Mr. Poulter, said I, I took you this afternoon for a disinterested and philanthropic millionaire. You take me for for something different from what I am. We have both made mistakes. In a word, it is impossible for me to accept your offer. Is that final? asked Poulter. Certainly, said I. Poulter gathered his manuscripts together and replaced them in the bag and got up to leave the room. Good evening, Mr. Dale, he said mournfully as I opened the door of the room. Good evening. He kept on talking till he was fairly out of the house. Mark my words, you'll be sorry, very sorry, one day, that you did not fall in with my scheme. Offers like mine don't come every day, and you will one day regret having refused it. With these words he left the house. I had little appetite for my dinner that evening. End of section 23 Recording by Bill Cisna, www.billcisna.com. Library of the World's Best Mystery and Detective Stories, Volume 2, by Julian Hawthorne, Editor.